Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but throughout the world, to another edition of this delightful game. <laughs> and also to welcome the four experienced and skillful players of the game. And first of all, we welcome back one of the original players of the game, who's been with us for 34 years, and that is Clement Freud. And the other three players are equally experienced and skillful, and we welcome back somebody who's recently won a comedy award, and that is Graham Norton. And on the left side, sitting beside me here, is a person who should, I'm sure, soon win a comedy award, and that is the lovely Linda Smith. And sitting beside her is somebody whom I'm sure deserves to win the Comedy Award, and that is Tony Hawks. Would you please welcome all four of them? And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to keep the score for me, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And um, this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the elegant and beautiful Theatre Royal in that vibrant city of Nottingham. <laughs> and we have in front of us a vibrant Nottingham audience. <laughs> who are just ready to cheer us on our way. So let's get the show going with Tony Hawks. Tony, the subject in front of me here is smelling a rat. Tell us something about that in this game starting now. A couple of things to remember when smelling a rat. You should never get your nose too close to the rat. <laughs> Otherwise, it may take a little bit of a nibble and always get the permission of your parents or, failing that, those of the rat. But, of course, <laughs> it, it does mean being suspicious about something. For instance, if the entire audience here this evening began to file out during this wonderful speech and, indeed, the panellists joined them and all went to have a drink in a pub in Nottingham City Centre, I would begin to smell a rat. That this whole whole evening had been arranged just to play a bit of a trick on me and leave me talking alone on this stage in this magnificent bill. And Clement Freud has challenged. Haven't we had magnificent? Not yet. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a given when I begin to speak, Clement, I think. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm case, still waiting for it. Good evening. <laughs> yes. No, he didn't say... Ma he said a lot else, but he didn't actually say magnificent. Uh, so, uh, Tony, that was an incorrect challenge. So you get a point for an incorrect challenge. You keep the subject, and there are 21 seconds left starting now. I'm led to believe that the odour emitting from a rat is most unpleasant, but there are some wonderful rat deodorants on the market you can get. Uh, ratty is one of them, I believe. Ratto, another one. And they're all quite... Uh, Linda Challenge, Linda Smith. Um, I think we had... Repetition of another one? Yes, another one he did say before. Another. Sorry, Tony. So I managed to... <laughs> I'm only doing I'm my not, job. I managed to... <laughs> Listen, that's, I'm... that's the rules of the game. <laughs> Well, you, know, you boo someone you when they play the game well. I, mean, I want to know how I managed to list two things and still managed to repeat another one. No, another. You repeated oh, uh, another, and oh, that okay. is repetition. Fine, OK. And sorry. so, Linda, you have a correct challenge. You have a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. There are eight seconds left, and you start now. Smelling a rat is essential if you want to ascertain that this creature is fresh and fit to eat. If it doesn't smell very... <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Linda Smith, so she gets that point on that occasion. So Linda is obviously in the lead at the end of that round. Graham Norton, will you take the next round? A very nice topical subject here for Nottingham, the goose fair. Will you tell us something about it? <laughs> I think they're already anticipating another way that you might take it, Graham. Uh, your reputation goes before you, obviously. <laughs> You've been on radio. So, Graham, 60 seconds as usual, the Goose Fair starting now. The Goose Fair is a world-famous event. Well, at least they've heard of it in Loughborough. <laughs> and it climaxes with the joyous crowning of the lucky girl who's named Miss Goose. <laughs> she then stands there while each inhabitant, young and old, forms an orderly queue, and they goose her one after another. <laughs> 
sometimes the glee and laughter can be heard as far away as Beeston. And God knows there's not much to smile about there. I... Oh, I've been through it on the train. Believe me, it's true. Hey, uh, Clement Roy challenged. Repetition of through. Yes, it's true, yes, it did go through, yes. No messing. This, I must say, this is the most partisan audience. I mean, they, they boo every correct challenge. <laughs> we, anyway, but uh, Clement, a correct challenge. You have a point for that, of course. The Goose Fair is a subject. 16 seconds are available, starting now. A very sensible thing to do at the Goose Fair is to smell the goose. Certainly <laughs> better than smelling a rat or dancing with courting, dating, eating. But goose baked in an oven with applesauce and prune is... Tim McCloyd speaking as the whistle went then uh, gained that extra point. He's now equal in the lead with Linda Smith. And Linda, it is your turn to begin. The subject, Franglais. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Franglais, Franglais, an allegedly humorous system of combining the English and French language with muddled pronunciation. For example, have un slice de gatox, which some people find amusing, but I personally consider to be a load of old bollo, and it doesn't entertain me in the least. I oh, I'm sorry, Tony, uh, your light came on, so you must have pressed your buzzer. Yes, you, you challenged. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. I don't know how my, my light came on. Uh, the, the, no, I have a little light that comes on when someone presses their buzzer, and your light came on. You must have given it one of those very delicate little... Right. Touches. In that case, uh, repetition. Of what? <laughs> um... Of uh, Franglais right at the beginning, although she's, uh, but she's allowed, allowed to, say to repeat that. what well, is on the card. I'm so, sorry, it's quite so tough to come up with a challenge when you haven't got one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise I'd be under this pressure when I came. <laughs> I thought I'd have, have freedom of choice, but no. <laughs> you have to just do it when Nicholas says. <laughs> no, Tony, your light came on. You could have said, I'm sorry, I didn't press my buzzer and I would have just carried on. Oh, okay. But you did actually decide to take a challenge. All right. So having. Well, can I. So, I... so Nicholas, that's. Technically, an incorrect challenge, and therefore uh, yes, a point for a me. Point. Of course, darling. <laughs> of course, the entire written. match is rigged, and in the pay of a Far Eastern betting syndicate. <laughs> Um, no, it wasn't one of those occasions. I was going to say, because he decided to take a challenge and is now an incorrect challenge, Linda, you get a point well, for incorrect challenge. it's getting worse for me now. I mean... <laughs> and you have 31 seconds to continue on Franglais starting now. Franglais. I'm somewhat dismayed to find that I have 31 seconds to continue on this rather dreary sub... Well, then Tony has challenged with firmness this time. Well, clearly you don't want to carry on, so... Uh... <laughs> only the gentleman thing to do to take the subject from you. And I, it was a deliberate challenge and I feel I should be rewarded for it. <laughs> Tony, browbeating the audience <laughs> is not one of the rules in just a minute. She was not hesitating, she was not repeating anything and she was not deviating. Oh, so no. Linda has another point and she has the subject still and 25 seconds on Franglais starting now. Well, frankly, Nicholas, I'm with Tony on this one and I can't <laughs> help feeling that the subject will be far better off in his bilingual hands than in mine where I am, I am stumbling... Uh, Graham Norton challenge. Repetition of amusing. <laughs> I didn't like to bring it up until now, but she's begging... <laughs> All right, Graham, you have Franglais and you have 15 <laughs> seconds starting now. I was originally christened Andre because although my father is Irish, my mother is pretentious. <laughs> of, of this name, a lot of people thought I should be able to speak French. Oh. So Graham Norton was speaking as a whistle again, that extra point for doing so, but Linda got a lot of points in that round, <laughs> mostly with her own talent and with some from her help from Tony Hawkes. So she's in the lead at the end of the round, and Clement Freud, your turn to begin. And the subject, a red herring. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Just a minute is not usually recognised as an educational programme, but I will, if I may, explain what a red herring is. It ceased to be a dish which is available to people in the 18th century because 
now we have kippers which are equally delicious and much easier to prepare. A red herring was a whole herring which was salted in extremely salty water and then smoked in astonishingly dense, thick fog, usually in Yarmouth. <laughs> and in order to eat it, you had to leave it in either milk or water until the... Um, <laughs> Tony Hawk's your challenge. I thought there was a timely hesitation. It was a timely hesitation. (laughs) So, Tony, a correct challenge. Nine seconds for you. A red herring starting now. I once saw a red herring whilst I was... (laughs) (laughs) I've waited so long. (laughs) Linda, you challenge. I think you know why. Yeah, but I have to hear it from your... Deviation. Deviation from the subject on the card, yes, and that is, therefore, a point to you, Linda, and six seconds to tell us something about a red herring starting now. A red herring, I think, in nature would be discriminated against by the other dull, drab herrings who are the... So, Linda Smith is forging ahead. Another point for speaking as the whistle went. And with other points, she's now in a strong lead ahead of Clement Freud and Graham Norton and Tony Hawkes in that order. And, Tony, your turn to begin. The subject... Oh, I say, this is going to be fun. The other members of the panel. <laughs> you have 60 seconds, as usual, to tell us what you think about the other members of the panel starting now. I think there's one thing that unites the other members of the panel. <laughs> Uh, Graham Norton challenged. I know what it is. I'm trying to stop him. (laughs) (laughs) It's radio, Tony. For God's sake, it's just a game. Leave it. Leave it. (laughs) It needs to calm down. (laughs) People have nothing amazing to know. Right, Graham, we give you a bonus point because the audience loved your interruption. Oh, for real. (laughs) But, um, and Tony, you get a point for being interrupted. You have 57 seconds. The other members of the panel starting now. And that is, of course, admiration for me. And I do get that a lot. People come up to me on the streets, they say, Tony, to what do you attribute your fantastic success in show business? And I reply to them, pity you, my child, for the wheels of this world ride on inexorably down dusty roads towards rich and fertile fields which give forth wheat. (laughs) And I can tell you, that stops them bothering me. It really does. that we have here are most distinguished and it's very unlikely that I will manage to talk for a minute without being interrupted given their brilliance. Graham Norton on the end here, I see him watching me, no longer nervous that I'm going to reveal the terrible thing he thought I was going to say. Sir Clement Freud, what a fantastic speaker he is, and yet he hasn't had the chance because I'm doing so well. Isn't he? <laughs> and Linda Smith here, got a bit of a lead early, but that's all slipping away because Hawks is on form. We all know that now. He's clearly going to go for the full whack. There's nothing going to stop him now. I can see that. <laughs> So, Tony Hawks, he got a point for being interrupted, and he got a point for speaking as a whistle went. He worked very hard for two points, but, uh, <laughs> but the audience appreciated. We loved it, Tony, and what has happened to the situation? Well, you moved into second place behind Linda Smith and Graham Norton. Your turn to begin. What my scales tell me. <laughs> Graham, I don't know whether you weigh yourself regularly, but tell us what your scales tell you. 60 seconds, starting now. What my scales tell me is that I'm slowly turning into a big Irish fish. (laughs) And I do now consider that that cheap holiday near Sellafield turned out not to be the bargain in the long term. (laughs) I'm a sort of Celtic Esther Williams. Irish Sea, I dash hither, tither. Uh, Tony Hawks has challenged you. Uh, repetition of Irish? Yes, oh. you talked about the Irish before. Irish fish, Irish. <laughs> no, no, trust me, you're glad. <laughs> <laughs> I've never known an audience. <laughs> Boo a correct challenge, and now they groan as well. It was right. He listened well. Applaud him for that. 34 seconds are available now for you, Tony, having got another point to tell us what my scales tell me, starting now. My scales tell me that I am 14 and a half stone, which is rather alarming because there is no speaker in them. And yet I hear this voice and it worries me because they shouldn't really be telling me anything at all. They should... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. (laughs) 
repetition of telling. <laughs> telling. <laughs> because the word on the card, you can repeat the whole of the phrase or individual words on the card. And telling is not there, it's tell. So, Clement, well listened. A point to you. To the audience couldn't care less, could they, really? <laughs> As long as you get the laughs, it just keeps going. So, 21 seconds, Clement, you tell us something about what my scales tell me starting now. What my scales tell me if I stand on the very extreme left front of them <laughs> is that I weigh hardly anything at all. <laughs> Whereas moving forward, what my scales tell me is too significant to relate to an audience which has Trent Bridge coming up any moment now. When <laughs> Clement Freud speaking as a whistle wing again, the next to point. He has moved forward. He's now, um, oh, it's uh, in descending order. Linda Smith, Tony Hawk, Clement Freud, Graham Norton in that order. And Linda, your turn to begin. A good soap. Tell us something about a good soap. 60 seconds starting now. A good soap is a soap that uses its cleansing powers for good, not for evil. <laughs> I think that members of my panel could use a good soap of various types. Tony Hawk suggests to me... Uh, uh, yes, Tony, you challenge. Deviation, I'm Tony Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a correct challenge, Tony. 44 seconds are now available for you to tell us something about a, a good soap starting now. I'm told Coronation Street is a good soap, but I don't watch it myself. My favourite was Neighbours. I don't actually entail... Uh, my <laughs> Graham Norton challenged. Oh, just he seemed to stop. There's a no, it major was, hesitation. A stop? No, it wasn't major. It was just a mini one, sorry. but it was a stumble, which we call hesitation. <laughs> 35 seconds. <laughs> ladies, no, ladies. No, I have, say, I have to say, with this audience, you do think thin line between audience and mob. <laughs> We beg you not to cross it. Uh, um, a good soap is the subject, Graham. You have 35 seconds starting now. In France last year, there was severe flooding. This left many people in a condition known as washed. For <laughs> soap is not something that is very familiar to the lovely French people. I'm only joking, obviously, because it's a sort of comedy cliché that the lovely people of Gaul... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. Repetition of lovely. Yes, you had too many lovelies in. <laughs> you are the most fickle audience I've ever played. <laughs> you start off by booing correct challenges, now you're applauding them. <laughs> Clement, listen well, 14 seconds. You tell us something about a good soap starting now. I'm torn between El Dorado and Gerlain Almond. <laughs> but I think... Perhaps East Enders, because it's still on, would be my favourite soap. What is so significant about this tale of... So we heard from all members of the panel on that particular subject, which is what I like to happen. And uh, Clement Foy was speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point. He's now... Oh, it's an interesting situation. He, Linda Smith and Tony Hawks are now all three equal in the lead. But coming up just behind them... <laughs> ..is Graham Norton. Yeah. Right. Clement Freud, your turn to begin the subject. Hesitation. So, will you talk on hesitation, 60 seconds, starting now? Of the three things you may not do in just a minute, hesitation, deviation and repetition, hesitation is probably the one that one is least able to talk about because of fluency. For instance, telling a story of a man with a gun and two bullets confronted with Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Joseph Stalin, Ken Livingston, <laughs> the vicar of Dibley. <laughs> so he shot Ken Livingston twice. <laughs> you see, the hesitation was uh, essential. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> Tony Hawks, you challenge in that long hesitation. Yeah, well, I was, I, I, initially I was going to leave it because I thought it's hesitation, yeah. but he's allowed to hesitate because he's talking about hesitation. But then I thought it was repetition because he hesitated twice. <laughs>
I thought he was writing his laugh, which is recounting that particular story very well, and uh, he wrote it too long, so I think it was a genuine hesitation within the rules of just a minute. So, Tony, you have the subject with 22 seconds. Hesitation starting now. It is a good thing on occasions to hesitate, not in this programme, obviously, but fools rush in a little circumcension is... Or a word that's... <laughs> I'll be selling a dictionary afterwards uh, with some of these words in. I, you can look them up. I hope you didn't say what I thought you said. <laughs> Linda, what was your challenge? My challenge was uh, deviation. I have no idea what circumcension is. Oh, right. It was deviating from English as we understand it, and it is not this good. <laughs> so you have a point for that, Linda. And 13 seconds, you tell us something about hesitation starting now. Hesitation, as well as being an important part of this game, just a minute, was also a sin that <laughs> Hamlet... Uh, Graham Norton challenge. I don't know why. Uh, but it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of hesitation, wasn't there? No, uh, no. Well, to you, hesitation. To me, breathing. I mean, you know. <laughs> we'll go with breathing. Uh, no, I don't think she hesitated. I oh, think fine. she stumbled over a word I didn't understand. Oh, it. that's right, Nicholas. No. Why are you so aggressive with me when I'm nearly always on your side? No, Nicholas. Well, I have to make a show of it being some kind of game, Nicholas. Don't you? Oh, right now. I wonder whether you were fighting for your feminine rights with three four men surrounding you, because you don't need to, Linda, because you, you can hold your own with all of us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I've been in the Rocky Horror Show too long, haven't I? Right. Um, you have an incorrect challenge, so you get a point for that, Linda, and there are six seconds still for you on hesitation starting now. Hamlet hesitated over whether or not to kill his stepfather, whom... The... <laughs> So Linda Smith has had another surge. She doesn't seem old enough. <laughs> Her surge is a lot older all of a sudden. <laughs> this so surge she... fellow, where, where does he hang out? <laughs> <laughs> I was referring to the clothes you wear, right? So she had a number of points in that run, including one for speaking to us. went, and she has taken the lead again ahead of Tony Hawkes and Clement Freud in that order. Graham, it's your turn to begin. Well, if, uh, just, if our listeners wish to be reminded, we are in Nottingham, and a very apt subject comes up now. Lace. Tell us something about lace. <laughs> in 60 seconds, starting now. I am a huge fan of lace. <laughs> so you can imagine my excitement when I was told I was off to Venice. Yes, the Nottingham of the South. <laughs> it is there that you can witness vast amounts of lace, which is sort of the donut equivalent to sewing, for it is just threads around a hole. It seems pointless, but there, someone's got to do it and go blind. <laughs> lace rarely makes up an entire garment. Usually it's just a collar or a cuff or something very dirty around the hem. <laughs> I've stopped. Yeah. So, Linda, what's your challenge? Hesitation, eh? Another point to you. 19 seconds. You tell us something about lace starting now. Nottingham's lace-making history probably gave your most famous rock combo the idea of their name. I speak, of course, of paper lace. <laughs> can forget their chart-topping days. No, I... Uh, Clement Freud can. Me. <laughs> well, well, do ha tell me how you did it, Clement, because I can't live with the pictures in my head anymore. <laughs> Clement, I've given everyone else a bonus point for certain challenges. You haven't had one yet. You have a bonus point because the audience enjoyed that challenge, but it wasn't within the rules of just a minute, so Linda was interrupted. She keeps the subject. Six seconds available. Lace starting now. Of course they could have thought... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. She said, of course, earlier. She did say, of course, when we started that. <laughs> so, Clement, another point to you, and lace and four seconds starting now. Through the Nottingham lace of the curtains, or was it his bees-winged eyes? <laughs> so, Clement Freud is creeping up on Linda Smith. Uh, <laughs> Behind the late surge. Behind the... 
we're into the last round. And uh, Linda, it's actually your turn to begin. And the subject is Little White Lies. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. Little white lies are tiny untruths that we tell to smooth the social fabric of life. For example, if I were to say Nottingham Forest had a marvellous season and I'm sure they'll go up next year, that wouldn't be a little white lie. That would be a huge, great, stonking Melton Mowbray of a father. Speak lost and unfortunately... Sadly, that's not uh, Clement very... Clement Freud challenged. I thought there was a hesitation. <laughs> Clement, you have the benefit of the doubt, and 34 seconds on Little White Lies starting now. This is a reference to Snow White, who was known as Little White, and told the most appalling untruths, <laughs> like that a wolf was banging on the door of the hut, and an old witch put out her finger, and it was eaten, and she didn't have enough food... The lions and the tigers and the camels. Graham, you, you challenged. Nowhere have I heard this. <laughs> I can't sit here. My mother will phone me and say, No, how could how you sit through that? These are not the stories I told you. They were no. lies. All of them. But yes. you're telling a lie. Yes. Oh, I see, but then that's not a little white lie. No, that's a major lie, that was. Deviating from nursery rhymes and uh, little uh, childhood stories like that to that My extent. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> So, Graham, you have a correct challenge, and you have 15 seconds. Little white lies starting now. A truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. So said my Aunt Deirdre, the fat, sour-smelling creature. It's a phrase I've never quite understood, and so don't use it very often. Well, as I said a few moments ago, that was to be the last round, and we have no more time to play. Just a minute. But let me give you the final situation. Yes, uh, Graham Norton, who gives such... <laughs> he finished in a very strong fourth place. <laughs> he wasn't very far behind Clement Freud, who was often out in the lead there. He was in second place. He was one point behind Tony Hawkes, who was in uh, second place, but a few points ahead was <laughs> Linda Smith. So, Linda, with all your surging today, we call you the winner. <laughs> then it remains for me to say thank you to these four outstanding players of the game, Graham Norton, Linda Smith, Tony Hawkes and Clement Freud. I also thank uh, Janice Staplehurst, who's kept the score for me and blown her whistle so charmingly. We also thank our producer, Claire Jones, who keeps us all in delightful order and uh, when she can. And um, also we are indebted to the original creator of this game, Ian Messiter. And so from me, Nicholas Parsons and all of us here, goodbye. Tune in next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our listeners throughout the world and also the four individual distinctive and talented players of the game who've joined me for the show this week. We welcome back with great pleasure that very popular player Paul Merton, the stylish player Stephen Fry, the charming, entertaining player Linda Smith, and the oldest player on the show who's been with us in the first, <laughs> when the show first started over 34 years ago. That's Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? As usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from that subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep a score, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Radio Theatre in the centre of Broadcasting House, in the heart of this great metropolis of London. 
and in front of us we have a really hot, warmed up <laughs> audience because we're experiencing a heat wave for the first of two days in here in London. Let's get on with the show. Paul Merton, will you begin? The subject is, oh, ideal for this hot weather. What I wear in bed. <laughs> will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? Marilyn Monroe said the only thing she wore in bed was Chanel Number no. 5. And I'm rather similar, except that I do not bother with Chanel's... Uh, Clement Freud Challenge. Repetition of Chanel. Chanel. That's I said Chanel and Chanel's. You did. There was an, uh, a genitival S just as, uh, <laughs> just as Clement was buzzing. He said mm. Chanel's. Yeah. Well, I thought he said Chanel, and as much as I'd I love to Chanel have you... I said Chanel first time, then he said yeah. Chanel's. I was going to say Chanel's perfume, because I was aware that I'd said Chanel before. And having, <laughs> having played the game for 12 years... I'll give the word go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're wriggling on this one, in spite of the fact that uh, Stephen Well, when Fry... it goes out on the radio, we'll find out who we're was right. So <laughs> <laughs> in spite of the fact that Stephen Fry has already decided to back up the German or, or take over from I German, did I don't buzz know, before the genitival S. Yes, uh, he did, actually. Yeah. He did. He, he, he buzzed very rapidly and very, very capriciously. And so, Clement, I said that is a correct challenge. You get a point for that. You take over the subject. Think, so you were allowed to buzz in the middle of words? <laughs> He buzzed at the end of the word before you changed it into another word, or tried to, to try and wriggle out of it. I have decided that Clement Freud is a correct challenge. <laughs> and I'm he has the audience with you. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, you have 53 seconds. What I wear in bed, starting now. 53 seconds is a very long time to describe what I wear in bed, because I wear nothing at all in bed. I have my skin... Such bones as press against the skin. Uh, uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Dare I say repetition of skin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to dare. You, you said to... two skins. Anybody could have gone on to three skins. Who knows what could have happened after that? <laughs> oh. We're You're being delighted. You, Paul. <laughs> Paul, a correct challenge. A point to you. 40 seconds available still on what I wear in bed starting now. I let the air get to my body, and why not? Lucky combo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say air twice. You were going to say Chanel's again or something like that. Uh, Linda, you challenge on that occasion. Yes, I did. I think there was just a general loss of the will to live there from yeah. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we, we call that hesitation. 35 seconds are available. Linda, you have a point, of course, and what I wear in bed is with you and we're dying to hear starting now. What I wear in bed depends very much on my mood. Sometimes I wear a yogi bear outfit and when my boyfriend joins me in the bedchamber, I rifle through his picnic basket. It's lots of fun. Sometimes I just wear something a little more casual than that. Perhaps I'll dress up as uh, Homer Simpson or some other... Uh, Paul Merton Chan. Was there an er in there? There was an er in there, just, yes. yes. Homer. Yes, you yeah, see. Oh. Oh, no. oh. Oh. I buzzed before she got to the end of the word, Nicholas. <laughs> Actually, she was speeding up, and then suddenly she erred. And uh, but um, maybe well, to err is human, I think. Mm. Yes, and especially when you're in bed, uh, my love, it's it's delightful. Um, <laughs> concentrate, Nicholas. Yes. Concentrate. <laughs> uh, my mind had gone. I was with you there, Linda, all the way. Um, <laughs> I don't wonder what I would have worn. Anyway, listen. Doesn't this count as sexual harassment in the workplace? <laughs> a hot no, audience no, does not deserve to have this picture put it, in their it's, head. It's, it's titillation, too... not titillation, not harassment. 14 seconds. Paul, you have another correct challenge, another point. What I wear in bed is with you. 14 seconds starting now. Before I get into bed, I have a long, hot, bath, which I draw from the taps into the porcelain receiver. I then... <laughs> Linda, challenge. So surely this is deviation. Why? The question isn't about bathing. It's about what he wears in bed. No, but he did say, and he hadn't, he hadn't really got established. What he, before he gets into bed, he draws his hot bath into his porcelain thing from the tap. I felt we were, we were in for a long session in the bath with Paul, though. Well, I know <laughs> you were, but you didn't allow him to go in too long in the bath. He'd gone a bit longer in the bath, and I think it would have been deviation. But so, Paul, benefit of the doubt, still with you. Another point, five seconds left. What I wear in bed, starting now. Then I get out, towel myself from head to toe, and that is the moment I jump luxuriously into the bed. Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Paul Merton, and you won't be surprised to discover, of course, that with the other points in that round, he's in a strong lead at the moment. And Linda Smith, your turn to begin. The subject, sunbathing. 
very apt for this time of year in this country at this particular moment, but talk on it starting now. Sunbathing. Sunbathing is all very well, but it's no substitute for a proper wash. It doesn't get you clean. <laughs> Protecting your skin from the sun's damaging ultraviolet rays is very important when sunbathing. Select your skin protection. Stephen, your light came on. Repetition. <laughs> a repetition of the word skin. I don't know why you laugh. <laughs> she did repeat the word skin. Oh, you did I? I thought I said yeah. skin and skin care. Well, skin, it's a repeating of skin, even if it's hyphenated. The skin is the word, and this is radio, so and it's what you have. another skins, then. Yes. <laughs> Which adds up to... Uh... Stephen! <laughs> you had a correct challenge, uh, repetition, and the sunbathing is now with you. 43 seconds are available, starting now. Much the same as daughter bathing, I suppose. I've never really done either, not having children myself. Sunbathing, though, as probably spelt on Nicholas's card, is with a U, not an O, and refers to that awful habit of lying on beaches being drenched. Uh, Linda challenged. I think he said, awful habit. Yes. Prostitution. <laughs> it's, it's a thing that harlots do. It's yes. awful. <laughs> Absolutely foul. No, yeah, it's, no, it's no. prostituting one's body to the, to the rays of the earth. It's awful. <laughs> you knew that. Even, even if he put a slight aspirate in front of the awful, I still don't think he was actually deviating. It was too harsh, Linda, really. So we give him the benefit of the doubt. He keeps the subject, a point for an incorrect challenge. 31 seconds, still available, Stephen, on sunbathing starting now. That ghastly smell of Hawaiian tropic coconut and frangipani that reminds me every summer that it's the season again for this kind of procedure. A thing I loathe, I must confess. Most people like hot weather. I find it repulsive. I'm a winter animal. For me, it's muffling up against the cold air, not the beams of the great solar eye, which burn and itch and twitch and make me sneeze and dribble and drool. <laughs> Paul Challenge. I don't know that the sun makes you twitch. <laughs> But your skin twitches, doesn't it? And you know, and you're very uncomfortable. And I think he was giving some descriptive phrases to say how uncomfortable and miserable you are if mm. you are burnt by the sun. Mm. And the benefit of the doubt, once again to Stephen, six seconds available, sunbathing Stephen starting now. Slip, slap, slop is the advice they give in Australia. Um, Linda Challenge. Oh, I was foxed by the fact that it was three words that sounded nearly the same. <laughs> <laughs> very honest of you. And in fact, we're three different ones. Isn't it marvellous, the English language, really? <laughs> hey? It's a well, rich tapestry, isn't it? I know, but we'd love you hearing from you, Linda. Four seconds. <laughs> Sunbathing, still with you, Stephen, starting now. Cover your skin to protect against UV radiation. Uh, Clement Shunt. Repetition of skin. Yes, you, oh. you, you had skin before. Five yeah. skin at last. <laughs> <laughs> We're safe now. Yes. Clement, you cleverly got in with two seconds to go. It's sunbathing with you starting now. Beaches are best. <laughs> I'm sorry, Stephen challenged before the whistle. Two there, was a big, there was a kind of half a second hesitation. He did hesitate. Best. He thought the whistle was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be fair. When this audience goes home and listens in a number of weeks' want time to, be to this fair, recording, then time beaches are best. Yes, and, see and you how saw one can say Janet that in Staplehurst less than two put seconds. the whistle up to her mouth, and you thought that's it. But, uh, but I believed you when you said two seconds. I was foolish. <laughs> Again, though, nope. will you? Nope. 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 <laughs> but if it's two seconds, Janet, we must put the whistle up after one second. And uh, Stephen definitely got in just before. So you know, there was a hesitation. No, that's only fair. I have oh, to for God's interpret sake, can't the rules. Can't you all say how this bickering about the time is driving us apart? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to justify everything, otherwise they'll all be at my throat. Right, <laughs> Stephen, half a second on sunbathing, starting now. Prep use. Uh, someone challenge. <laughs> I thought it was a hesitation then. No, no hesitation. No. <laughs> so Stephen Fry was endeavouring to speak then as the whistle went and he gained extra and other points in that round so he's taking the lead one ahead of Paul Merton Clement Freud and Linda Smith following that order and Stephen it's your turn to begin and the subject is spilling the beans you spilled a few beans in your time particularly in your autobiography but mm. tell us something about that subject in this game starting now if I were to spill the beans about Nicholas Parsons and tell you that the young girl who passes by the name of Nicolette and uh, moves around Hampstead Heath... Uh, Linda challenged. Well, he did say, er, uh, but it, really that wasn't why I challenged. I just didn't want to go any further into that story. <laughs> <laughs> I was hanging on every single word. 
I think you'll find most of it sub so just... <laughs> the benefit of the bar, once again, Stephen, I'll make sure that you get it the next time, Linda. And there are 53 seconds spinning the bean, Stephen, starting now. We live tragically, don't we, in an age of checkbook journalism and kiss-and-tell biography, an age in which, oh dear, I've repeated age. Um, yes. <laughs> And Linda got in even without your prompting there. So, Linda, you have got a correct challenge. Spilling the beans, 46 seconds, starting now. Spilling the beans is a reprehensible habit. I would never dream of doing such a thing, which Stephen has just done. I, for example, know that Nicholas, our esteemed chairman, likes... Uh, Stephen Fry challenge. Unless there's someone else. I can't think of an esteemed chairman called Nicholas. <laughs> You're a rotten audience. <laughs> Oh, You're the applauding the insults as well as the laughs. I would almost like to take a point away from him for that. Anyway, I'll tell you what, I'll show you how generous I am. I'll give you a bonus point because the audience enjoyed your challenge. No, but Linda gets a point because she was interrupted. She keeps the subject. There are 35 seconds on spilling the beans starting now. Mr Parsons enjoys hiding in people's gardens wearing a long black wig and then sneaking up to their patio windows and going, it's me, Heathcliff, it's Cathy, and pretending to be... Oh, Paul, you challenged. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should know, because you were there, weren't yeah, you? Absolutely. Uh, so, Paul, hesitation, 24 seconds. Spinning the beans with you, starting now. Well, if you've got a chef who's been out in the sun and he's got heat stroke, the chances are he'll start twitching, which is the very thing <laughs> you want to avoid when you're asking that cook to walk across the floor of the kitchen with a pan of beans. There is nothing that customers hate worse at the <laughs> finest... Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Deviation. Why? Grammatic. <laughs> hate, hate worse. You can't hate worse. No. <laughs> you can't hate... <laughs> Isn't, isn't worse a German sausage? No. <laughs> no. I hate it. I can't stand the stuff. <laughs> so, um, Clement, yes, we give you deviation there. Eight seconds. Spinning the beans starting now. Spinning the beans means telling people something which is secret or not in the public knowledge, and this might be a good time... <laughs> On that occasion, Clement Floyd was speaking as the whistle went, so he has got that extra point for doing so. He's moved forward. He's in third place, just behind Paul Merton. Uh, Stephen Fry is in the lead, and Linda is not far behind all three of them. And, um, Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Ludo. Tell us something about Ludo in just a minute, starting now. Ludo has absolutely nothing to do with spinning the beans. On which subject? Uh, Stephen Fry Chan. I may have been a little precipitous there, but I, I thought he was hesitating. But I, I thought it was hesitation too, oh, Stephen. Yeah. So Between you have. Between a... two words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there any way to hesitate? Is there any way? Right, Ludo, with you, 55 seconds, Stephen, starting now. From the Latin, I believe, I play Ludo. Also, of course, the shortening of the name Ludovic. Uh, Kennedy, for example, is known as Ludo. There's a game uh, called Ludo. Uh, Linda Challenge. Well, yeah, I'm just wishing I hadn't, really, because of there nothing to say about it. But there was an er. That's right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Right. This time I give you the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. you. Just I'm when I don't want it. I remember <laughs> these things. 45 seconds for you, Linda, on Ludo, starting now. Ludo! And <laughs> well, it's hesitation. She clearly doesn't get want going, to say my it. love. Uh, I, I, sorry, I was miles away. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, you have a correct challenge. You have uh, 43 and a half seconds on Ludo starting now. It's been a while since I played Ludo. If I remember rightly, each competitor has a different colour, don't they? Like blue, green, yellow, orange, that sort of thing. And you have to throw a six to start. And it's a game played with dice. And you... you uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Stephen Challenge. Well, sort of mixture of repetition and, uh, That's and hesitation right, yes. It's an exciting round. This is a most stimulating subject, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> really set their brains alight. Um, so, 30 seconds are available. You tell us something about Ludo now, Stephen. There are various pastimes based on it, like frustration, and indeed things like Trivial Pursuit can be said to have a kind of ludic version of, of the original game. But I, I think the O oh, Call help. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> There was, there was a lot of... There was two rapid eyes. Uh, uh, eye yes, eye. yes, I know, right. 21 seconds. Ludo's back with you, Paul, starting now. Well, it's a fascinating... Uh, Clement challenge. He said well last you time. You did say well mm. last time. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, Ludo, with you. 19 seconds, starting now. Ludo is a game I never cared for a lot because Halmer was more fun. Both games, I've played games uh, before... <laughs> 
Paul challenged. Uh, hesitation. Hesitation, yes. And you've got the uh, subject back. 13 seconds. Ludo, starting now. At the Potsdam Conference, Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin and President Roosevelt all sat around 6 o'clock one evening for a fascinating game of Ludo. Uh, a <laughs> challenge. A uh, repetition of fascinating. In his previous round, he started, well, it's a fascinating, and uh, Clement interrupted to say repetition of, of well. well but you well, it's not... like you're listening to every word I say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, it's, it's... Nicholas, do I understand this right? You can never use a word that you've ever used before in your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather a harsh rule. <laughs> no, if you repeat that word in any one round, that is repetition with the rules of just a minute, and he did say fascinating before. Mm. And so four seconds is available for Stephen to tell us something more about Ludo starting now. Homo Ludens is a marvellous book about... <laughs> uh, Linda challenged... Well, no real time. I just felt educationally insecure with all this. <laughs> I thought I might take the opportunity to try and sell you a bunch of violets. Buy a bunch of violets for the poor girl. <laughs> oh, you're a gentleman, Mr. Fryer. No mistake. All right, all Linda. The audience appreciated your interjection, so we give you a bonus point for that. But Stephen gets a point for being interrupted, and he keeps the subject of Ludo. And there is one second left, starting now. Aviaris <laughs> Yaktar. Well, that exciting subject uh, gave a lot of points to all our <laughs> players in that round. Uh, Stephen Fry is still in the lead. He's just ahead of Paul Merton. Then comes uh, Linda Smith and Clement Freud equal in third place. Clement, it's your turn to begin. Now, the subject is TV dinners. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I think it's very sad that people eat the same TV dinners regardless of what is shown on their television sets. <laughs> My suggestion would be that there would be a different TV dinner for gardening... Four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you came in first, and we all heard the falls. 46 seconds are available for TV dinners with you starting now. I think there's something inherently lonely in the concept of a TV dinner. It's like those pot noodles things. You have to be incredibly alone in the world to want to pour hot water onto powder and think somehow that's going to do you any good. <laughs> TV dinners, I've had quite a few of those when I lived in bedsits in the 1980s. There was uh, no proper... Uh, Linda Challenge? There was a... Yes, when you lived in the... Uh, there um... was no... Was yeah. there? There was there, yes, there was. Really? No, this is correct. 25 seconds. TV dinners with you, Linda, starting now. TV dinners. I'm not sure that I've ever eaten an actual TV dinner which seem to appear in old American films where people have those little trays with compartments that have to be thawed out and then put into the oven for quite a long time until they suddenly re-emerge as these lovely little repasts consisting of a starter and a main course and some kind of a pudding and Americans would sit in their... Uh, Paul Challenge. Um, I thought she was going to say American again, but she said Americans. <laughs> it's one of those things, Nicholas, when somebody says a word like Chanel <laughs> and then they say Chanel, as you see, it's a difference. Uh, the, I, S, I, the S makes it a different word, in fact. I think you made your point uh, very vividly. <laughs> yeah. In the end, I'll be so embarrassed, I'll have to give you an extra point for oh, not going so, but... <laughs> Uh, right, so uh, she didn't repeat American, she did Americans, and you, you unfortunately got him with one second to go, gave her another point, and she keeps the subject. One second, TV dinners, starting now. TV dinners. Is so Linda Smith got points in that round. She's equally with Paul Merton in third place, just behind Clement Freud, who's a few points behind our leader, who's still Stephen Fry. Linda, it's your turn to begin. The subject, working from home. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Working from home, I work from home, it basically means you are your own boss. Regretfully, as I'm a lazy and shiftless worker, I have been forced to threaten myself with the sack recently. <laughs> One hopes that yours truly doesn't find out that for years I've been fiddling the company. I've made thousands out of that Linda Smith. She's too stupid to realise. <laughs> I've been nicking stationery every day that I've gone up to that... <laughs> Paul Button. In a true sense, you're just hurting yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your challenge? Well, it's, it's, it's deviation. You can't steal from yourself, because then you end up with you've still got it. <laughs> If she's still Criminals, Paul, a... always make one mistake. Do they? <laughs> That's mine. She was stealing from herself. Deviation. That's a very clever challenge. It is, actually. isn't it? Yes. Don't look at me so amazed. <laughs> 
I agree with you, Paul, and you have 34 seconds on working from home starting now. I don't do any work at home at all. In fact, all my work in... Uh, Stephen Challenge. <laughs> well, I thought he was a little hesitant, I don't know. If I'm no, right. I don't I think, think he was. So. No, no, was no, no I don't think so. He still has the subject. I don't 30... think so. I think he's just basically quite shy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of a handicap in this show. <laughs> 30 seconds are available, Paul. Working How many? 30 seconds. Oh, I don't need that much. <laughs> I'll do it for 10. <laughs> Clement might do it well, for 15. It'll well, make yes. a better offer. We'll see what happens after 10. Working from home is still with you. 30 seconds ago, starting now. I work from home. I'm a gigolo. Uh, Clement for a chance. <laughs> Repetition. Of what? Work. He mm-hmm. said work before. You're yeah. quite right, Clement. Well, You're listen. not allowed to use cognates of the word on the card, then. No, no, not cognates, no, definitely not. You can repeat any of the words... That's a thick London accent, isn't it? A cognate. cognate. <laughs> so you can just say working, but you can't say work. You can use repeat. either the phrase or any individual word again, but you can't use part of the word mm-hmm. uh, work. He said repeat work. Clement Listen heard it. 29 seconds available, Clement. Working from home, starting now. Edna St. Vincent Millay, who was a famous <laughs> 20th century American poetess, wrote a verse called... I burn the candle at both ends so deep into the night and are my friends and oh my foes it throws a lovely um, light. Stephen Challenge. Of course, he may say that poets work from home, but just simply quoting a poet is not the same as talking about working from home, is That's it? That's what she was doing at home. Yes, I dare say she was, but it's not really discussing the subject on the card. Uh, uh, the way I take Stephen's point is that you did not establish that in writing her poems she was working from home. You I just... got the impression she was. I didn't think she was sat in, in an office writing. That. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to make this. I'm going to leave this final decision to the audience. You're going to be signed. I'm not. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> no, you can be the final arbiters and judge on this very delicate situation because you can interpret it either way. If you agree with Stephen's challenge, you cheer for him. If you disagree with his challenge, you boo for Clement and you all do it together now. <laughs> you agree with Clement Freud. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Stephen. That's all right. I'm Clement, sorry. you have the benefit of the doubt. The audience is on your side. 14 seconds, working from home, starting now. Housewives work from home, ironing and washing going out to shop and cook and... Ah. <laughs> Linda challenge. Hesitation. It I was think. hesitation, Linda. Eight seconds. Tell us something more about working from home starting now. Working from home involves an awful lot of staring out of the window and drinking 500 cups of tea a day. Not everybody... So, at the end of that round, what is the situation? Because uh, Linda was speaking as a whistle went, gained that extra point, she's moved forward. And, oh, it's very interesting, actually, because we're moving into the last r- round. Linda is only just in second place. But equal in third place are Paul Merton, Stephen Frank, Clement Freud. Get out of here! Get out yeah. of here! <laughs> and I is, mean that quite literally. Yes, isn't it exciting? <laughs> And I know the only reason you come on the show is for the excitement that they generate, Stephen. Oh, gosh. It is good to have a good sport on the show, isn't it? Um, (laughs) So this is the last round, and Stephen, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is on the crest of a wave. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. I'm on the crest of a wave because the show has pointed to this great moment of excitement and climax, the summit and apogee of all quiz show moments, which is that this... (laughs) (laughs) Paul Challenge. It was a hesitation, sir. It was a hesitation. On the the crest of a wave. And there are 51 seconds available, Paul, starting now. We're riding along on the crest of the wave and the sun is in the sky. Lots of listeners listening to that will know and recognise that as Ralph Reader's theme tune to the gang show that was very popular in the war years and afterwards. It's one of those songs that manages the rhyme Horizon with Eyes On, which I think is a very good uh, use of rhyming. Uh, Stephen Challenge. Uh, I was a bit hesitant there again, but I'm probably wrong. No, I usually am. No, 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 no. He was keeping it going. Yeah, he was. He was. You're pace. right. I'm sorry. He was. Yes. I mean, he was. I'm sorry. I'm was... God. I'm sorry. Please, yeah, Nicholas, accept that. I made a mistake. He was recreating. Won't happen again. I promise. All the Boy Scouts. There. He was back I'll there. Why you in the gangster? <laughs> He's out of bed again, nurse. <laughs> Did you ever take part in the gang show? I was never in the gang show, were you? No, no, no but I used to watch them, yes. Mm, clearly, the, the, clearly, you spent a lot of your time watching Scout, Scouts, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Scouting for boys. Right. 31 <laughs> seconds, Paul. <laughs> we have someone here who was a Boy Scout, weren't you, Clement? <laughs> he was for, in, in, in his youth. In his well, youth. I didn't think it was last week. <laughs> Thank you.
No, I don't think the gear would suit him today, but as oh, a schoolboy. Right, 31 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Paul, still with you on the crest of a wave starting now. If you want to go surfing, then you need two essential ingredients. First of all, you must have the sea, and within the ocean there, there should be big waves. Uh, Linda, challenge. It was there, there should be. Sort of there. a bit of a, he- bit of a No, it's an echo. There's a funny echo it's in echo. here. <laughs> I've heard that before. It's a funny echo, isn't it, Nicholas? It is a funny echo, it's but funny I echo, think uh, hmm. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt on this occasion to Linda and say yes. We'll call that hesitation, Linda. 19 seconds, Linda, on the crest of a wave starting now. People say they're on the crest of a wave when everything in their life is going fine, when they're really happy and nothing could be better. I have never felt on the crest of a wave. I feel much more that I'm sort of losing my sandals in the mud at South End. <laughs> it's a different kind of sensation, a bit more challenging. Well, Linda, with that late surge, speaking also in the Whistle End game, that extra point, she only finished just in third place, one point behind two who are equal in second place, that is Stephen Fry and Clement Freud, but just two points ahead of them, so they're all very equally poised. They all got almost the same amount of points, but Paul Merton, with two more than anybody else, you are the winner this week. <laughs> we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only means to thank my four... Excellent players of the game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Linda Smith and Stephen Fry. Also thank uh, Janet Staplehurst, who's kept the score for me, blown her whistle so charmingly when the 60 seconds was up. Our producer, Claire Jones, and also the, we're indebted to the creator of this game, Ian Messita. From our audience, from our four panellists, from everybody else, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. (laughs) Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country but around the world, but also to welcome the four individual and talented performers who this week are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back... uh, uh, a delightful, a very witty and enchanting player of the game, that is Tony Hawkes. We welcome back a most distinguished player of the game, that is Clement Freud. We welcome back, after quite a break actually, one of the more sardonic players of the game, that is Jeremy Hardy. And we welcome for the first time to play the game a delightful and enchanting comedy performer, that is Sue Perkins. Would you please welcome all four of them? As usual, I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst. She's going to help me keep the score. She'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute comes from the Dorking Halls in Dorking. You are all very welcome as we start the show with Tony Hawks. Tony, the subject is keeping your eye on the ball. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. There was a PE teacher at my school who used to say to me, Hawks, whatever sport you're playing, it's vital that you're always keeping your eye on the ball, which I suppose is why I was never very good at chess, boxing, or (laughs) synchronised swimming. But the English football team are very good at keeping their eyes on the ball. Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Repetition of very good. Yes, you were very good earlier on. Um, yeah. yes. Listen, if you're going to be as partisan as that all from the start, I mean, <laughs> we're going to have problems. Clement Freud, you have a correct challenge, so you get a point for that, of course, and you take over the subject of keeping your eye on the ball, and there are 37 seconds starting now. Ice hockey and badminton are two pursuits in which it is fairly pointless to keep your eye on the ball, <laughs> but football, cricket, squash, tennis rugby, fives, all those pursuits, it is essential to keep your eye on the ball. Another description of keeping your eye on the ball could be what protrudes from the other side of your central girth. And there are many people 
who have more than one ball in that... Um, Tony Hawk's have challenged. Well, he's talking about this is this, this team for everyone. There's at least 50% of the audience here having nothing protruding from their... <laughs> Tony, we enjoyed the challenge, but I, I do think that uh, he did make out the fact that that applies not necessarily to the whole of the population. So we would give you a point because we enjoyed the challenge, Thank you. Uh, but it's an incorrect one. So Clement gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject. There are six seconds available. Keeping your eye on the ball, Clement, starting now. Our cricket team is fairly famous for not keeping it. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Repetition of cricket. As you mentioned cricket before. And Tony, you've cleverly got in with three seconds to go, having got another... <laughs> it's part of the game. <laughs> and the subject is still keeping your eye on the ball. Three seconds starting now. If I was a policeman on surveillance... Uh, oh, Jeremy, you got in, yes, there. Yeah. If I were a policeman. <laughs> uh, As you've been Unless so he was speaking in the past tense. <laughs> yes. But he didn't think of that. Well, no, it no. Was if I was a rich man, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, I know, but they were peasants. <laughs> <laughs> and Cossacks on their back. The whole Tsarist yeah. regime down on them, Tony. I think they were under more pressure than you. And as, as, as people do listen to this programme abroad to try and uh, improve their English, I think we should... Be... <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? I get letters <laughs> saying... We have to have people coming from China all spoke like Kenneth Williams at one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the image is lovely, isn't it? I think deviation from English uh, is correctly spoken. So, Jeremy, we give you a point for that, and you've cleverly got in with one second to go. Keeping your eye on the ball, starting now. Keeping... Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Jeremy Hardy, and therefore he is probably in the lead at the end of that round. He is. He's one ahead of Clement Freud and Tony Hawkes. And, Jeremy, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the commuter belt. Tell us something about... Oh, that's got a little echo in the audience. <laughs> we are in a commuter belt area, I should explain to our listeners abroad. Um, 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Sometimes it is necessary to belt a passenger sitting opposite one on the docking service. If, for example, he is bellowing into his mobile phone. I don't want excuses. Tell him to get his arse in gear, which is a preposterous expression, meaning we know not what. Therefore, in a situation like this, it is fair play to whip off your belt, wrap it around your fist, and just clock him a couple of times in the air. Not so much as to induce deafness or even bleeding or an eye to pop out of its socket, but just to remind him that there are other people on that commuter service who want to sit peacefully, maybe reading the Evening Standard, which can take four or five minutes, <laughs> potentially just thinking about the day, unwinding, doing a little bit of work on their laptop, hopefully with a computer. <laughs> and in those circumstances, it is only right that one should... Res uh, Sue, you've challenged. Uh, I haven't got any points. That's why I've tried. <laughs> My dear, stick with me and I can give you all the points you need. <laughs> I'll cling close. <laughs> Sue, so it's lovely to hear from you, and yeah, the, audience well responded, yeah. the audience responded with such warmth to your interruption that we will give you a point for that. Sue has got a point, and <laughs> Jeremy was interrupted, so he gets a point for being interrupted. He still has the subject, and nine seconds on the commuter belt starting now. A hurly bat on the knee is possibly an overreaction to the problem of people speak... Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. A uh, repetition of people. Yes, you said people Oh, before. fair play. Well, there's more than one. I know. <laughs> You, you repeated the word. All oh, right, I understand. If we're going to quibble about the rules. You can struggle all you like, but... Uh, uh, Man whose only crime was to break the rules of the programme. <laughs> Four seconds available for you, Tony, on the commuter belt starting now. I used to have a lucky belt which I wore round my trousers when it... <laughs> Tony Hawks got the point for speaking as the whistle went and with the other points in the round he's now taking the lead one ahead of Jeremy Hardy then Clement Freud and then Sue Perkins and Sue it is your turn to begin and the subject is my worst nightmare my worst nightmare is a recurring nightmare which features Joan Collins dressed as a Pekingese dog <laughs> she's standing at the head of a large swirling staircase I am beneath her uh, and Christopher Biggins is on top of me he is dressed as a chihuahua and is eagerly licking my face in 
the background stands my mother, grinning with a photographer from Hello magazine. <laughs> Happily snapping as Mr. B's large purple proboscis slaps around my visage in no uncertain fashion. If anybody knows the word that I just said and the meaning of it, if they'd like to write to me, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> Just to the left of me stands Anthea Turner and her sister Wendy Turner, currently embarking on a brand uh, new... Clement Floyd challenged. <laughs> 48 seconds, not bad, but Clement, yes, she did repeat. Turner... Oh, no, you that's should... not why I challenged. Why, 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 why did you challenge? I wanted her to have a point. <laughs> Nothing if not difficult, Clement, but it's all appreciated. Right. So there are 12 seconds still available for you because uh, Clement has been very generous and given you a point, and you carry on now with my worst nightmare. 12 seconds starting now. And you've been challenged. Repetition of Turner. <laughs> you certainly know... You certainly know how to win friends, yeah. don't you? I didn't think you'd allow it. Are you allowing it? Uh, well, technically, I suppose right. I should, but on the other hand, if, as Clement was so generous and had a challenge and gave it away, no, I think I you withdraw, should do the same I thing. Withdraw. I, was I think doing you it should for do the same purposes, thing. No, but no. I didn't realise that everyone would want to lynch me. <laughs> <laughs> so I withdraw. Sue, Sue was interrupted, so she gets another point, and she now has ten seconds on my worst nightmare, starting now. These terrifying. Uh, Jeremy Hardy. Far challenge. be it from me not. <laughs> Not to be offering points to Sue at this point. Well, I mean, Sue's. Very... I'm not going to be shown up here. I'm a good hearted man. Right. Okay, so the point is hers. The point. <laughs> so your colleagues have been most generous, and you've got nine seconds on my worst nightmare starting now. My other. And you. <laughs> Clement. Hesitation. Yes, that was hesitation. <laughs> She was so shattered at the generosity of these four in, intrepid players of the game that she couldn't believe it and couldn't get going again. Eight seconds now available. My worst nightmare, Clement, with you starting now. I take sleeping pills, so I don't have nightmares. I don't, <laughs> in fact, even dream. Uh, Jeremy Hardy challenge. Repetition of don't. Don't, yes. Oh, it's a tough one, me, but me. it's true. Mm? Huh? You wait. I'm the only Yeah, but you stopped. <laughs> you a... picked on her. Yeah. And I'm you a want... local charity when it comes to comedy, apparently. <laughs> you want to play hardball? We can play hardball. Right. OK, four seconds, Jeremy. Uh, you have my worst nightmare starting now. Sitting in nothing but a vest on top of a bus. <laughs> Jeremy Hardy, with points in that round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, has moved forward. He's one ahead of Tony Hawks and Sue Perkins and Clement Freud. They're all equal in second place. Tony Hawks, Sue Perkins and Clement Freud. And Tony Hawks, your turn to begin. Stirring. That's the subject. Just stirring. Tell us something about it. There's been plenty of that going on already in this show. But talk on the subject. 60 seconds starting now. Just before the show, I overheard Jeremy Hardy saying that Nicholas Parsons is the finest performer that there has ever been in show business <laughs> for the last 50 years. No, obviously he didn't say this. What I'm doing is stirring, because there will then be an argument between my colleague and the other panellists over to whether he's lost his judgement completely or gone completely bonkers. Uh, Sue, your challenge. Uh, completely repetition. Yes, yes, repetition of completely. <laughs> right. 36 seconds for you, Sue, on stirring starting now. In the dressing room before the show, I uh, couldn't help noticing a large stain on Nicholas's trousers. <laughs> I was at pains not to point out whilst in front of him, but decided to mention in front of 400 people at the Dorking Hall. This is... Could, was con <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you challenged first. I think there was a hesitation amongst others. There was, yes. Been, in fact, I mean, I must explain to my listeners, everybody's buzzer was pressed, but the one who gets in a fraction first, a light comes on in front of me, in front of their name, and that is the one who gets it. Fingers right. hawks, they call me. <laughs> 
Tony, stirring's back with you, and there are 22 seconds starting now. The hardest kind of stirring is the stirring that you are required to do early in the morning. I'm not necessarily someone that goes out and drinks an enormous amount of alcohol, but I have been known in the past to have a few pints, and the alarm clock goes off, and I think, no, I've got to get up and face the day I don't want to. Stirring is the last thing on my... <laughs> And uh, Jeremy, challenge. I just want to say I think Tony's doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> so go for it, Tony. <laughs> We're all rooting for you here. <laughs> so within the rules of just a minute, have you a challenge, Jeremy? No, no, no. no. None at all. <laughs> Tony has a, a point for an incorrect challenge. Keeps the subject. One second on stirring. Tony's starting now. Glove puppet. <laughs> So the contributions are all equal, and so are the points at the moment. So Tony Hawks, Sue Perkins and Clement Floyd are equal in the lead, just one ahead of Jeremy Hardy. And Jeremy, it's your turn to begin. Oh, this is a nice subject. The skin of the custard. <laughs> He's got a good reaction. Tell us something about the skin of the custard, starting now. The skin of the custard is a highly prized pelt, leading to the possible extinction of the custard. <laughs> They can be shot, but that tends to leave a little wee hole in the skin, or they can be trapped, which is cruel. Although the Countryside Alliance think that it's not cruel, and the... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Ah, uh, repetition of cruel. Well, there was too much cruelty going ah, on. Ah, yes, yes, fair yes. play to you. Yes, fair well play, Jim. Right, you have the skin of the custard, Clement Freud, and you have 44 seconds starting now. You would never get a lot of skin on custard if you kept stirring. I thought this was an important thing to mention. <laughs> My, my children like the skin of custard uh, more than custard. Uh, Jeremy, you challenge. There was an er uh there. Yeah. Only. Yeah. What? Listen, who's running this show? The audience are here. <laughs> it, was, it, was only, um, it was only infinitesimal. I don't think it was enough for me. I must also have I to judge. I that's right. Yes, I think. Mm. <laughs> Clement, you still have the skin of the custard, and you have 31 seconds starting now. As a consequence, I always made custard in baking trays, so that there was a lot of skin and <laughs> hardly any of the custard. This was hugely important. Similarly, um... Y yes. <laughs> oh, the trigger-happy Hawks got it there. Poor First old, one poor old the Jeremy, desperate to get in that time. I, I, really. Yes, and I saw all your finger yeah. thumbs go down on your buzzers, oops. but yours went again. first, and you've 20 seconds for the skin of the custard, but Tony. Uh, is fine, but um, is controversial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I see the way the cards are stacked in this game. <laughs> no, you'll see that if I have an opportunity to give you the benefit of the doubt later, Jeremy, I will certainly do it. I might not feel like it then. <laughs> <laughs> That was a longer hesitation with this er or um, that was a longer one, and I felt it was definitely a hesitation, and so Tony has the subject. <laughs> the skin of the custard, Tony, starting now. Some ways, I believe that the skin of the custard is like a metaphor for life itself. The pro <laughs> uh, Jeremy's challenged. You can't be like a metaphor, you're a metaphor. <laughs> or you're... Me like a metaphor. You can, if you're not. could be a simile for a metaphor, I suppose. Yes. If you're this... actually not a metaphor, but you look a bit what, like one. <laughs> no, no, it's true within the rules of just a minute. So you will have the benefit of the doubt on this occasion. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you have the subject, 13 seconds, the skin of the custard, starting now. Custard farms have been springing up all over the south of England. <laughs> the custard rights protesters have broken in and released the custards, causing ecological breakdown as they fight the mink and produce a new race of super rats. <laughs> Jamie Hardy speaking as a whistle wind, gained that extra point. And it's still very close. He and Tony Hawks in second place, one point behind Clement Freud. And they're just one ahead of Sue Perks, who uh, Perks, Sue Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> it's that endearing I, familiarity. That I like. know. <laughs> Well, I went out with the Sue Perks once, I suppose. That's what it was, Sue. Um, Did you get any Perks? <laughs> I wouldn't tell you one just a minute. Uh, Sue, the subject is stars. Tell us something about those in this game, starting now. Catch a falling star and put it in your pocket. Save it for a rainy day, goes the song. Now, grabbing a fading celebrity is an easy matter. All you need to do is stalk them, 
but putting them in a pochette is a very different matter. I took Meg Matthews, used a winch, but even so it was a tight squeeze, although on a cold and rainy afternoon, she did indeed entertain me with stories of her bad boy rock and roll marriage to Noel Gallagher. <laughs> German. She's We're sucking a peppermint. No, I finished. <laughs> I was, I was just breathing. And she hesitated. And she hesitated. Right. 33 seconds available for you, Clement, on stars, starting now. The plough is probably my favourite stars. There are five... <laughs> Tony Chalice. Well, since we're having a bit of a grammatical show... Yes. <laughs> the plough is my favourite stars. Yeah. If he, if he said the constellation of the plough is my favourite stars, then that would be, the, it'd be in the singular. But mm. stars, yes, I think that is grammatically incorrect, Clement. I'm sorry to have to disagree with somebody who's <laughs> right so eruditely. There's white heat coming off Clement. Resist. Absolute white heat. Fight, 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 <laughs> fight, fight. Hawks is dead in the car. How many park stars? That... I'm meeting Sue Perks later. <laughs> <laughs> As some people in the audience seem to think that Clement was grammatically correct there, I will let you be the final judge on this occasion. So if you agree with Tony Hawkes' challenge on the grammatical uh, indiscretion he thinks that Clement committed, then you cheer for him. But if you disagree, you boo for Clement, and you all do it together now. Boo. They are with you to a man and a woman and a child, uh, um, uh, Tony. So you have the subject and you have 28 seconds on stars starting now. I read my stars earlier today and it said that as a Pisces, I would be able to talk for 28 seconds on this subject without being interrupted. And normally I think these are rubbish, but clearly it's not the case because this is turning out to happen right now. How extraordinary an event. I'm going to read them tomorrow to see what beholds me in the future there too because I am unbelievably excited by the prospect of going how long is this bloody 28 seconds <laughs> I think they were applauding the look of agony on your face Tony as you tried to keep going but you got there to the end you got that extra point you're equal with Clement Freud in the lead just ahead of Jeremy and Sue Jeremy uh, Hardy your turn to begin yes. the subject is working the system Tell us something about working the system in this game, starting now. The richer you are in this country, the less tax you pay. This is what we mean by working the system. If you have a good accountant, by which I mean a clever one, rather than one who has a pure soul or is untainted by worldly things. Yes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, Sue, you, you challenge. Politically, I'm on side, I want to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think you might have repeated one. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. fair play. Well played, yes. Yeah. So, okay. Sue, well listened, you've got in there. You've got 46 seconds to tell us something about working the system starting now. I would like to find this accountant that means that you can save and thus bear a much, much reduced tax. <laughs> <laughs> Clement was the first one to get in. Working. <laughs> Working the system, Clement, and there are 46 seconds... No, sorry, 39 seconds left starting now. When I was a Member of Parliament, I had many letters from people asking me to introduce a bill for the registration of plumbers, and these are people who work the system. Uh, Tony Hawke's challenge. A repetition of people. Yes. Working the system with you, Tony, starting now. I had a system which I used to work whenever I went to a casino. I would go in and play the blackjack, and this was advice I had taken from friends. I would put money on, operate the system they had suggested, and lose my money. This... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two lots of money. And you, yes. the money, yes, you're right. Clement, you got back in again. 15 seconds, working the system starting now. A very good system to work in a casino, possibly the one to which Tony Hawks went, is to play blackjack and depend on the banker getting a six, against which number almost anything that you, the player, might receive is beneficial. <laughs> Clement Freud, with the extra point and other points in the round, has increased his lead at the end of the round. And Sue Perkins, it's your... You can't stop him there. I was writing that down. <laughs> I think it was six. Oh, right. But then what do you do? I don't know. <laughs> stick, on, stick on a 12. Right. I mean, anything. Excellent. A Thank six you. is so likely to have the band cut. <laughs> 
Where's the nearest casino in Dorking? <laughs> I'm off. See ya. <laughs> Right, so back in, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is sisters. Tell us something about sisters, 60 seconds starting now. Sisters exist to remind you of what you could have been had you benefited from the better genes of your parents. <laughs> sisters walk around with cameras and video recording equipment and always seem to be on hand to capture those misery-inducing moments, which they then play back in full view of all your assembled friends and family, saving the best, of course, for the boyfriend, where they will reveal you as a four-year-old, totally naked, skipping round and humming like an innocent thing projected on an enormous wall, six foot high. Other things that sisters tend to do is generally not laugh at your jokes, feel ashamed of the chosen career, talk about performances you've given which were less than sufficient, and possibly mention this one, where I've tended to repeat the word must. <laughs> Stop her, Nicholas, before, before her relationship with her sister breaks down completely. <laughs> if it wasn't a valid challenge within the rules of just a minute, then Sue is interrupted, so yeah. she gets a point for that and keeps the subject. And 15 seconds available for your sisters, Sue, starting now. The other thing that sisters tend to do is be a lot brighter than you are. They're also blonde, have a much better figure, and run fast, although why somebody sprinting very, very... Co- uh. <laughs> They it's love called you. as an idiom. That's my idiom. That's, That's what your I do. idiom I of speech. <laughs> but they love you for it. But uh, it was repetition. And Tony yes. was the first to get in. Five seconds, Tony. Sisters, starting now. Sisters are doing it for themselves. This was a huge hit, but what exactly was it that they were... <laughs> oh, so at the end of that round, Tony Hawk speaking as a whistle wind gained... <laughs> An extra point. Uh, he's moved forward. He's only one point behind Clement Freud as we go into the last round. And Sue Perkins follows in third place and then Jeremy Hardy. They've got a few points to catch up if they want to win. And um, That's very, 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 very unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know. It's happened once before. But, um, Clement, it's your... How many years have you been doing this show? It's happened once before. <laughs> The odds aren't looking good. But Clement, it's your turn to begin, and the subject we're going to the last round is the good old days. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. When people talk of the good old days, they inevitably mean hanging and molesting children, (laughs) Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street with a deerstalker hat, horse-drawn carriages, trolley cars, trams, all the things which we're really rather pleased that we do not now have. <laughs> Tony, you challenge. I think he'd made his point, hadn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he won't have a bit to lie to down, I think. So we call that hesitation, Tony. So you've got in with 39 seconds on the good old days starting now. For once, I couldn't agree more with what Sir Clement was saying. How foolish it is to live our lives in the past looking back at the good old days when the important thing is to cherish tomorrow, to go out and do something that will be, if you like, the good old days of the future. Because we must not bury ourselves in what has happened. (laughs) Jeremy Hardy challenge. It's pure rhetoric with no substance. (laughs) (laughs) A shrewd comment, but have you a challenge within the rules of just a minute? Well, if you're going to be picky, then no. (laughs) 16 seconds. Uh, incorrect challenge, Tony. You've still got it. The good old days, starting now. When I was a very little boy, I used to watch a programme on the television called The Good Old Days, and it used to come from City Varieties in Leeds. And it did look a lot of fun, I have to say. How I wished I was up there in that audience, dressed in ridiculous outfits, (laughs) cheering useless old songs. (laughs) Right. So I said that was to be the last round, and Tony Hawks interrupted and then kept going till the whistle went, gained two more points, so he has come out just ahead of Clement Freud. So in ascending order, it was Jeremy Hardy, Sue Perkins, then Clement Freud, but two points out in the lead, Tony Hawks, so we say he's the winner this week. (laughs) 
I'm sure that applause is for all of them for their valuable contributions. So it only remains me to thank our four great players of the game, Tony Hawks, Jeremy Hardy, Clement Freud, and Sue Perkins. Also to thank Janet Staplehurst for keeping the score so magnificently for me. And we are also deeply indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game, and indebted to our producer, Claire Jones, for her producing and directing. And we're indebted to this audience here. <laughs> Yes, Jeremy. Repetition of indebted. I know. <laughs> I, I was making a sort of speciality of it, uh, deliberately. Oh, this is I outside see. the game. Oh, postmodern. Uh, uh, <laughs> and we're indebted also to this audience here in the Dorking Halls who've come far and wide to enjoy the show. From them, from the panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time you play Just a Minute. Until then, goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute! Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners in this country and throughout the world to this amazing show. And it's also a great pleasure to welcome back four exciting, talented, and skillful players of the game. We welcome back the uh, wonderful, outrageous wit of uh, Graham Norton, the charming wit of Linda Smith, the exuberant wit of Tony Hawkes, and the clever wit of Clement Freud. And will you welcome all four of them? <laughs> and as usual, I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who is going to keep the score for me and blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the beautiful Theatre Royal in the centre of Nottingham, one of those great Matcham theatres. And the people of Nottingham are proud of their theatre, and they're proud that they're in this audience here. <laughs> ready to cheer us on our way. So let's get moving rapidly with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject on the card in front of me is stuffing a chicken. <laughs> After the words I've just <laughs> used about this elegant theatre, to come down to stuffing a chicken is a bit low. But anyway, that's the subject, Clement. 60 seconds as usual. Start now. I've always considered stuffing a chicken to be an ignominious pastime, pushing bits of bread and herb and spice salt and parsley, egg, beer, wine, <laughs> into the cavities of a chicken has got to be one of the less exciting things that you can do in a kitchen. <laughs> yes, he thought about it and absolutely came to a halt. So, Linda Smith, you challenged. I challenged yes to the old uh, hesitation there. Hesitation, yes, is a correct challenge. So, Linda, you get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. There are 38 seconds available. It is stuffing a chicken starting now. When stuffing a chicken, the most inf... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Graham Norton, you got I was got just preparing to go swear word. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. You saved me from myself there. <laughs> right. Hesitation. Graham, you have a, a point for a correct challenge. You have stuffing a chicken. And you have uh, 35 seconds, Graham, on stuffing a chicken starting now. Stuffing a live chicken into a black plastic bag <laughs> is considered a good night out in Loughborough. <laughs> Gather on street corners with their fowl going, Oh, look, I've got ready ties in my sack. And people ooh and ah as the flapping chicken. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. There was, a, interestingly, a, a repetition of ooh, because they said, ooh, look what I've got in my sack, and then ooh, ah, later, you see. Ah. Oh. 
They're pretty sharp, aren't they? So, Tony Hawks, you have a correct challenge, and you have a point for that, of course, and there are 14 seconds left, and you will take over the subject now of stuffing a chicken starting now. If you are going to stuff a chicken, always get the permission of the chicken's parents first. <laughs> Otherwise, they could just get very upset indeed with you and start pecking around. I've never actually stuffed a chicken myself, but I have caught... <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Tony Hawks, and at the end of that round, he is naturally in the lead. Uh, Linda Smith, will you take the next round? The subject is contact lenses. Tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now. Contact lenses. Speaking as a very short-sighted person whose glasses prescription is very similar to that of the Hubble telescope, <laughs> I love contact lenses. They've made my life so special. It now means I can walk around without two cup glass ashtrays clamped to the front of my face, drawing very unfavourable comparisons. Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. The third very. Yes, oh. too much very. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Kind after two. <laughs> <laughs> that that was an interesting one because it went to dis from disapproval to grudging appreciation. <laughs> no, I, I think I think there are uh, there are partisan groups in the audience actually. I mean, so one lot suddenly booed the challenge and the other might cheered it. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's good it's good to have feeling, isn't it? As long as uh, it was a correct challenge because you, you did repeat very Clement. You have the subject of contact lenses. Thirty nine seconds starting now. My eyesight is pretty good, sort of 2019. I couldn't repeat the first number again. But so I have never had contact lenses. <laughs> On the other hand, I did once open up a chicken which had been stuffed and found a contact lens within it. Not just liver and kidney, lights and throat, tongues and eyes, but a contact lenses in the chicken. I've said chicken again. <laughs> it's only a short challenge. Well, I think he, he's kind of was deviation because he, he couldn't repeat contact lens, reali realising that that wasn't the subject. So he said a contact lenses, which doesn't, make, doesn't didn't make exactly sense. make sense, did it? No. Right, and he repeated chicken as well, but that doesn't matter. A correct challenge, Tony Hawk. Seven seconds. You tell us something about contact lenses starting now. It's very difficult to find a buyer for contact lenses if you try and sell them separately, <laughs> which is what I did a few months. So Tony Hawks was again speaking as the whistle went again, that extra point for doing so, and he has increased his lead at the end of the round. In fact, the other three are equal in second place. And Graham Norton, it's your turn to begin. And the subject here is socks. Can you tell us something about socks starting now? Socks is famously the name of Bill Clinton's cat. And I'm reliably informed it's the only pussy in the White House that Hillary doesn't mind Bill stroking. <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> socks. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm angry. I think that's the first time someone's brought the show to a complete halt. <laughs> uh, but Clement Freud, you uh, pressed your buzzer and challenged. I thought there was a hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> and well, might he hesitate after what he said, Clement? There was a hesitation. About uh, a twenty-second hesitation. <laughs> But that was for the audience, but uh, it was worth it, wasn't it? Clement, you, you tell us something about socks in 25 seconds, starting now. A number of American baseball teams call themselves the White Sox or the Red Sox. And should you go to watch them, you'll be hugely disappointed because they also wear boots and pants and shirts. <laughs> and those who think they're in for an interesting pornographic evening are hugely disappointed. You have... 26, maybe more. <laughs> Clement Freud, speaking as the whistle went, has moved forward. He's now in second place, one point behind Tony Hawkson. Tony, it's your turn to begin. The subject, to have your cake and eat it. 
and that is the subject in this game, 60 seconds starting now. I used to think To Have Your Cake and Eat It too was the sequel to the film To Have Your Cake and Eat It. <laughs> but it isn't, in fact. It's this expression, to have your cake and eat it. And what is so unreasonable about that? Cake is nice, you eat cake. Is it so strange? Uh, Linda challenged. Oh, actually, no. Didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> well, either you're going to say Sorry, something. Sorry, I was miles away. Um, well, I don't know. Just a stab in the dark? <sighs> Hesitation? No. Uh, <laughs> Deviation? No, I no. don't think... I don't think... He was almost hesitating. I think that's uh, where you probably anticipated an hesitation. Didn't happen. So, uh, Tony... <laughs> An incorrect challenge. Another point to you. 39 seconds. To have your cake and eat it starting now. I suppose it's another way of saying that you can't have everything in this world, that you need a little balance. And hell, that's true of me. You can't have my looks and still be good at the game just a minute. You'll see in a minute I'll hesitate or keep... Uh, Linda, challenge. Repetition of minute? Yes. Mm, you, well, yes. I rest my case. <laughs> So Linda got in. Another point to her. She has 24 seconds. That must have been a psychic challenge that I did before. Why? Well, because then, you know, I anticipated that he was going to hesitate. Yes. I frighten myself sometimes. (laughs) But you, you you have your. (laughs) Uh, Linda, to have your cake and eat it, and there are 24 seconds starting now. To have your cake and eat it is probably illegal. It sounds very, very. Oh. It's so easily done. Very, very. Clement, you were the first in. 11 seconds to have your cake and eat it starting now. This is a confectioner's nightmare, but to have your chicken and eat it (laughs) is something which I would recommend to everyone, quite particularly if it is stuffed. (laughs) Get... Clement Freud gained that extra point. Speaking as a whistle went, another point has moved forward. He's now equal with Tony Hawkes at the end of the round, and Linda Smith and Graham Norton are equal in uh, second place. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is toupees. You have uh, 60... <laughs> He's taken it a very good part. I think you should explain why, Clement, because we do have listeners who can't see you. Uh, <laughs> in fact... <laughs> None of our listeners can see us. That's right. It's amazing the things that strike you suddenly. With... Oh, this is the joy of just a minute. Right. Clement, two pay, 60 seconds, starting now. I went recently to a dinner party in Soho and was seated opposite a man who was wearing a toupee. And there's something hugely embarrassing to a toupee wearer confronted with a man who is bald, such as me. I have little hair. I don't want to say that I have lost any hairs because... Oh. Uh, Tony, why did no, you No, he got me. I, he, I thought he was going to repeat hair, but he said hairs a second time. So, uh... Well done, Tony, but uh, <laughs> all that happens is Clement was interrupted, so he gets a point for that and keeps the subject. And 40 seconds still available on two pays starting now. I know where everyone has gone. It's the sort of <laughs> philological euphemism which I dislike. <laughs> Um, you challenged. He's obviously drifted into a reverie. <laughs> <laughs> he came Hairs out with he the... has known. <laughs> I think he was... He appeared to me to be stunned by his own profound statement. Uh, <laughs> uh, Clem, I'm uh, sorry, um, Graham, a correct challenge. 33 seconds, two pays, starting now. If you lose your hair, I don't know why you would choose to wear a toupee because it just makes you a figure of fun. People point and laugh and go, look, there's someone with a bit of old car seat cover on their head. (laughs) It's fooling no one. I appeal to the nation now, take them off. They're just stupid. (laughs) Point the (laughs) stick. Where am I now? (laughs) Clement, you challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was hesitation, right. And uh, there are eight seconds. You have the subject of toupees back again, starting now. I very much agree with everything that Graham Norton has said and congratulate him on winning a BAFTA award. (laughs) Sadly, on the day that... (laughs) 
And Clement Roy with more points in the round as well as one for speaking. As the went has moved forward, he's taken the lead ahead of Tony Hawkes. Then come Graham Norton and Linda Smith, equal following. Linda, it is your turn to begin. <laughs> The subject, oh, I don't know why they thought of this, but we are in Nottingham, Robin Hood. <laughs> Just a minute. You have to talk on Robin Hood, Linda, starting now. Robin Hood, I love Robin Hood, especially the song. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men. Feared by the bad, <laughs> loved by the good. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. He called the to a tavern on the green, he vowed them to the service of the king. He handled all the trouble on the English country scene and still found plenty of time to sing. <laughs> right. Tony Don't you just love him? <laughs> Tony Hawks, you challenged before she I'm got afraid there. we did too many of the lyrics. We'll have to pay the uh, songwriter rather than royal. <laughs> So we're in co contravention of performing right rules. I only feel that as a, a lawyer, yes, it's my responsibility. Yes, but what about just a minute? Repetition, hesitation or deviation? All of those, yes. <laughs> deviation. Uh, why? Deviation from following the law of, uh, <laughs> of, of this wonderful land of ours. I mean, it's just, you, you can't, you see, you have to pay the... Uh, uh, I'll shut up. <laughs> Actually, I don't think you've made your case. She had other did uh, commit. No, she did deviate, though. Why? Well, it must be some sort of deviation to remember all of that bloody annoying <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. And you do think, thanks a lot, Linda. Now we all know it again. Yeah. <laughs> We've right. forgotten it. So, Tony, you didn't make your, your point very clearly, though. She yeah, was but Graham made this. it very well for me. I feel... <laughs> no, no, he gets a bonus point because the audience loved what he said. But. Uh... <laughs> But Linda kept going. I mean, nobody had... I mean, normally we don't repeat the subject on the car quite as often as that, but <laughs> you got away with it magnificently, Linda, so carry on. And you have 31 seconds, Robin Hood, starting now. Robin Hood was the first outlaw to popularise the use of tights, but on his legs rather than over his face, as is the now more popular use of this... Um, Graham, challenge. Well, there are two populars. Yes, and two use, right. So... <laughs> God, this it's like you're again. watching chess, isn't it? <laughs> very good, man. Very good. <laughs> uh, 22 seconds are available for you, uh, Graham, to tell us something about Robin Hood starting now. Robin Hood and his merry men. What a laugh that sounds. <laughs> Roaming through... Uh, uh, Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, you were going so slowly, I'm going to call that hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> there is a... God, you are fickle. You really are. <laughs> well, no. it must be mayhem in panto season here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it is! Oh. Clement, yes, I call that hesitation. 14 seconds for you on Robin Hood starting now. My favourite character in the Robin Hood saga is not Maid Marian, but Fra Tuck, whom I always thought was actually a spoonerism. Uh, Tony... Well... <laughs> Tony, <laughs> Tony, you challenged, I think, just in time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, I'm glad, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I heard him finish that little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, no, in fact, I, I may be wrong, but wasn't it Maid Marian? Yes, what did he say? Maid Mary, Mary didn't he? No, he said Maid Marian. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I put it to you that all of you heard something different to me. <laughs> Uh, Clement Freud, um, I hope you can continue with, in a different vein, and uh, <laughs> you have six seconds, Robin Hood, starting now. The Sheriff of Nottingham is an infinitely more significant person than the Mayor of Market Harbour. <laughs> so Clement Freud, speaking as the whistle went, has gained that extra point and has increased his lead, and he's surged ahead uh, above the other three. Graham Norton, it's your turn to begin. The subject, oh, how charming, over the rainbow. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Well, 
Judy Garland is famously obsessed by going over the rainbow. I always wondered why. Bluebirds fly there, an irritating little thing. Uh, lemon drops hang over chimney tops. Now, consuming sweets covered in soot can't be good for anyone, particularly a small child. She could choke and drop her dog in a basket. <laughs> it's also where you'll find it, uh, an alarming amount of... <laughs> Linda, you chant. I could be wrong. <laughs> you were right, Linda. There was hesitation, but uh, the audience were really caught up on his uh, rightful thoughts. But I, I have to play the rules of just a minute time. I'm sorry. And uh, I know the audience would... <laughs> I think mob rule has now finally taken over. Well, I'm not going to gonna be intimidated Judy. by the mob. I'm going to say... I have rules to interpret. I will be a referee and say, yes, Linda, correct challenge, so you have the subject. 34 seconds starting now. Over the rainbow, I think you would find not those items that Graham has mentioned, but Bungle, Zippy and Jeffrey. <laughs> They're the ones you find. Zippy with his voice that... Uh, Tony Hawk's oh. challenge. A uh, repetition of Zippy. Zippy came in again, yes. So, Tony, you tell us something about Over the Rainbow. 23 seconds starting now. Somewhere... <laughs> It's Graham Norton has challenged you. Tony, you know we can't afford that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, Graham. He True. was going on about performing rights earlier on, and now, yes. Well, my invoice alone for singing on this show would be <laughs> very right, expensive. Uh, no, that was going to be my point. I was going yeah. to go on to say that, uh, that given that we... W was we... that your big number when you were Morris Minor and the Minuets or whatever they were uh. called? <laughs> Morris Man of the Majors, no, no, it wasn't. It was, a, it was a, cleverly, we did another song that hadn't already been a hit. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> did he get into the charts? Uh, the one we did, yes, it was... It was um, please, do you want to talk about my entire CV? <laughs> no, but I well, thought I might give I've got two books out at the moment, if you're interested. <laughs> no, uh, we were interested in your past, you know, oh, okay. uh, in your, your, your pop record days. Uh, Graham, you tell us something about Over the Rainbow Gain, 20 <laughs> seconds... <laughs> They, they want to hear from Graham on Over the yes, Rainbow. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> Graham, they want you on Over the Rainbow. 20 seconds, starting now. Frankly, Nottingham, now I am over the rainbow. It's time to move on. Let's talk about other things. Cloud, sun, hello, trees. The rainbow is vastly overrated. Who can go back to rainbows after witnessing the northern lights? Gosh, they're terrific. <laughs> you see, you really didn't want me to go, but, oh, I'm still going. Oh, no, blow it, blow it. <laughs> I've said that before. Uh, <laughs> Linda did challenge you with half a second to go. Linda, what was your challenge? Uh, hesitation. It was indeed hesitation, yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, Linda, you have half a second on Over the Rainbow starting now. Over the Rainbow! You've been challenged. <laughs> Tom and Freud, you challenged. Hesitation. <laughs> the mob will not take over. <laughs> It was not hesitation. Another point to Linda, and quarter of a second to go, starting now. Over the rainbow is... So Linda got some points in that round, so has leapt forward and joined Tony Hawks and Graham Norton in second place, behind our leader, who is still Clement Freud. And Clement Freud, your turn to begin. And the subject, mobile phones. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. It is very difficult to give your mobile telephone number which now has 11 digits, without repeating one of them, but I will do my very best. It's 07968 5421, and I can't go on because otherwise <laughs> there would be the case of repetition and someone would buzz, and it's likely to be Graham Norton, who won a BAFTA award, <laughs> which I would... Uh, Graham, you challenged. A repetition of compliment. <laughs> Yes, but it was in a different round, you see. So in every round, we could all pay you a compliment and Did go on. Did you say something else twice? What's that? Did no. you say something else twice? No, Never. nothing else twice. Mm. No, 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 no he didn't. We did pay you a compliment twice, but it was the other Oh, round. that's a deviation. That's what that is. That's deviation. That's deviation, yes. Thank you. 
we've uh, tantalisingly nearly got Clement's phone number, though, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> and I reckon in ten goes, I could probably dial it. <laughs> Uh, Graham. Yes. Uh, yes, you're going to have that one. A correct challenge. Mobile phones, 33. Is... Hmm? Why is that a correct challenge? Because uh, he, he, said, he said you were deviating from the subject of mobile phones because you were congratulating him on his BAFTA award. On my mobile telephone. <laughs> ah. Oh. I said he was one of the cleverest players of the game. You did not establish that in my mind. <laughs> the callers, yes. Uh, right. <laughs> Graham. <laughs> 33 seconds, Graham. Tell us something about mobile phones starting now. Mobile phones are a terrific aid to modern communication. Imagine, dear new friends, how we could establish without the mobile phone to our loved ones that we're on the train. <laughs> or that potatoes will be fine, but make rice if that's what you have. <laughs> it's a super tool. We are now constantly available for all sorts of dreary calls from people we never want to So Graham Norton has moved back into second place alongside Linda Smith and uh, Clement Freud is still in a very strong lead. This is going to be the last round, by the way. And Linda, it's your turn to begin. The subject, allergies. Tell us something about allergies in just a minute, starting now. Allergies. Allergies are very popular these days. In fact, fashionable. In fact, I think they are the new black. Uh, Tony Everyone Chung, Tony seems... Chung. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear him. I, I thought didn't. there was a repetition of in fact. There was in fact twice, oh. yes. You have 52 seconds. You tell us something about allergies starting now. I'm actually allergic to mobile phones. This bloke on the train up was making so many calls it was just like being in his office. I wouldn't have minded, but he had me doing photocopying, making coffee. <laughs> Wife's going to Paris next weekend. He wants me to come with him. It's a nightmare. They're all over the place. I know the subject is technically allergies, but I think it's possible to come out in a rash listening to the drivel that these people talk. Anyway. Uh, Linda's challenge. Uh, people. Repetition of people. Yes, there was too many people there, but yeah. uh, you made your point anyway. Thank you. yes. 29 seconds, and subject's back with you, Linda. Allergies starting now. You meet people who have allergies to wheat. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of people. You did say people before. But he said that. He you said did it, too. but you said it when you oh, started. Oh, did I? Yes. Oh, well, thank you for pointing that out to me. <laughs> Clement, you have 26 seconds. Allergies starting now. People do have allergies. <laughs> An awful lot of them. They go to their doctors who invariably examine them, having taken their clothes off, and say, your trouble is allergies. Stop eating eggs. Begin consuming rice. Consolidate your menu with a higher starch content than you had previously. And allergies go on and continue. <laughs> Graham, you did get in with a quarter of a second to go. What was your challenge? I, do, I think I was wrong. I know it was. Yes. Yeah, so you thought he was going to say on and on. Ah, yeah, and I, I cleverly fooled twisted myself. It. So <laughs> he gets a point for an incorrect challenge, a point for speaking when the whistle should have gone. Let me give you the final situation. Well, it was, um, you know, it, it was an amazing situation because Linda Smith, Graham Norton, and Tony Hawkes all finished up equal in second place. Was showing appreciation for the value they gave, but now round of applause, the man who had more points than anybody else, and our winner this week, Clement Freud. <laughs> so, it only remains for me to say thank you to our four intrepid players of the game, Graham Norton, Clement Freud, Linda Smith, and Tony Hawkes. Also thank Janet Staplehurst for helping with the score, blowing her whistle so delicately. We thank our producer, the delightful Claire Jones, for producing the show with such elegance. And also we thank this audience here at the Theatre Royal in Nottingham for the way they've egged us on our way. And we are deeply indebted to the man who originally created this game, that is Ian Messiter. So from me, Nicholas Parsons, and from all the players here, goodbye, I hope you've enjoyed it. Tune in the next time we take to the air to play Just a Minute.
Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and also the four individual and talented performers who are going to play just a minute this week. We welcome back with great pleasure one of the most outstanding and popular players of the game, that is Paul Merton, and we also welcome back one of the senior and most skillful players of the game, that is Clement Freud. We welcome back, after quite a long absence, a very delightful and erudite player of the game, that is Tim Rice, and we welcome for the very first time a summer who's never played the game before, and that is Annabelle Giles. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who will help me keep the score. She'll blow whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I'm going to ask our players of the game to speak for just a minute, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Swan Theatre in the delightful Buckinghamshire town of Pyle. <laughs> and we obviously have a really high Wickham audience in the audience <laughs> who are going to cheer us on our way as we begin the show this week with Paul Merton. Paul, how I like to relax. That is the subject. Talk on it if you can. 60 seconds starting now. Listening to music, reading a good book, walking in the open air, horseback riding, looking at my tropical fish. These are the sort of things I do, often simultaneously, to relax <laughs> as I find that a whole world of show business can be locked behind the door and I can sink blissfully into my dreams as I look out of the window. <laughs> and um, Tim has challenged. I think we had a couple of looks. Yes, he did look before, yes. <laughs> and uh, so, if you repeat the word... And you challenged correctly? I said, I, looking, I said look, looking at tropical fish and then look out the window. Yes, I don't You're want to right stick up to You're <laughs> quite right, you did. You did. <laughs> Thank you, you clicked into my recall and... Uh, I I'm did gonna... what? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you've got a point for an incorrect challenge. You keep the subject. There are 41 seconds available for how I like to relax starting now. There's a plant that's grown in parts of the West Indies that if you put it inside cigarette paper and then... <laughs> Smoke it. It has the most extraordinary effects. I believe it's called a dandelion. And it's a <laughs> wonderful herbal uh, remedy. Clement Freud is challenged. Deviation. Why? If he believes that, he'd believe anything. <laughs> <laughs> so your challenge or deviation is the fact... Well, he could believe it. I mean, he may... It's uh, wonderful. I can't deny the fact that he's possible he could believe it. So, Paul, I think that's an incorrect challenge. And you keep the subject still. 28 seconds. <laughs> How I like to relax, starting now. Of course, one of the best ways of relaxing is to take physical exercise. Swimming is a particularly good way of getting rid of the stress and strains of everyday life, I believe, as an exercise. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. He believed again. Yes. You, <laughs> you have been believing too much. This time a correct challenge, Clement, a point to you, and you take over the subject, 17 seconds available, starting now. I go to relaxation classes where strange elderly nerds with beards <laughs> say things like listen to the noise of the crickets open your ears um, Paul Challenge you have to relax between sentences yes <laughs> <laughs> there's there's relaxing and it's taken a two week holiday between <laughs> sentences there was a definite hesitation. And if you do that, uh, you can relax. But if you do that in just a minute, we call that hesitation. So, Paul, the correct challenger point, how I like to relax, five seconds starting now. A woman in Earl's Court called Big Bertha gives the most extraordinary massage. You go round her out and for five quid... <laughs> Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Paul Merton. He has three at the end of the round. Clement Floyd has two. The other two have yet to score, but Annabelle begins the next round. Annabelle Giles, M making up. Tell us something about making up in just a minute, starting now. The other day, I was slightly caught short. As a hot date was coming round to visit my house, I had no makeup on me. So what I did, I made do with household products. First of all, I smeared my face with some margarine. I applied it with an ordinary household sponge. Then I filled a bowl with cornflour, blew into it. Uh, Paul Challenge. Could I just say, slow down, because people might yeah. be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, we, we give you a bonus point, because we enjoyed the interruption. And you have 45 seconds still available on making up, starting now. 
Mascara could be used in Marmite. Actually, I'm going to have to ask this. <laughs> Mascara can be used in Marmite. And it's madness. Is, 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 is a form of madness, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> It's a form of deviation of just a minute. I think so. so. Yes. Um, 41 seconds, Paul, on making up, having got another point, of course, starting now. The art of improvisation used in the comedy store where I... Uh, Annabelle. Did not say er? Uh? Yes, he did put an er uh in. Yeah. Definitely so. Oh, you got no. in. Uh, 38 seconds, making up, starting now. OK, try using cocoa powder for eyeshadow, because that'd be really good. There's also curry powder for, uh, 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 uh <laughs> Yes. Two powders. Yes. Yes, you know. Uh, well, is it? Right. 32 seconds. Um, Clem, tell us something about making up, starting now. Once upon a time in a town called High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire, there was an audience who was far from spontaneous in that they applauded and cheered and booed whenever they wanted to, quite irrespective of the validity of the challenge that might come <laughs> from this audience. Making up... Uh, Paul Challenge. We have two audiences there. I don't think you ha I, 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 Did the audience hear two audiences? Yes. Thank you Which very audience? much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you have seven seconds on making up starting now. When you're standing on a stage and you have no idea what's going to come into your head next, you could be accused of making it up as you went along. Indeed, that's what I'm doing now. So Paul Merton was again speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point. He's increased his lead. He's just ahead of Clement Floyd, Annabelle Giles and Order. Tim Rice follows, and Tim, you haven't yet scored, but you have a chance now. It's your turn to begin. And the subject is playing by the rules. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Playing by the rules is extremely important. It makes life continue happily and smoothly. However, there are exceptions to this when playing by the rules is wrong. And I would like to suggest that the ludicrous legislation brought in by this government about imperial units as opposed to the metric kind is an example when we should disobey and we should ignore, we should fout the government. <laughs> Playing by the rules is vital for any civilized society. How else could we survive on this tiny planet, this small orb spinning in the firmament, a mere 93 million miles from the sun, itself 864,000 of those units in diameter? It's absolutely crucial for every man and woman jack of us and Jill that we... <laughs> Paul Tanner. Every man, woman, jack of us. <laughs> Went a little bit odd there, didn't it? A little bit odd. No, every, every man... Yes. Every man, woman. <laughs> every man, woman. I, I was trying to be unsexist. No, he was saying every man, woman. I knew where the, I knew Jack where he was Jill. going. Was Christopher going to Jack no, it's not Jill. deviation from the English language. No, no, no. Every man, woman, Jack, Jill of us. I mean, yes, it, it makes sense to me. But then I've got to. Yes, well, that clinches it. Yes. <laughs> I could see his thinking, and I think he was keeping going cleverly within the rules of uh, just a minute. And he has playing by the rules still another point to him for an incorrect challenge. 14 seconds to him, starting now. Very few sports in this wonderful nation of ours would survive if the participants didn't play by the rules. For example, rugby, tennis, golf, hockey, <laughs> ice, lacrosse. <laughs> so, Tim Rice started with the subject, um, kept going to the whistle and gained that extra point for doing so, and he has moved forward from the last place into third place. And um, Paul Simmons, there's only the only odd point between them, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, uh, Tim Rice, Annabel Giles in that order. And Clement, your turn to begin. The subject is my star sign. Tell us something about your star sign in this game starting now. Let me begin by saying that I have a message for anyone born under the sign of Leo. You can come out now. My own star sign is Taurus. I was born on the 24th day... Um, Tim Chant. Two borns. First he rambled right, on yes. right, right. Well, listen, Tim. born under... 47 yeah. seconds on my star sign, starting now. If ever I see a star in the street to whom I take a violent dislike, I give him or her a sign that will let that person know what I actually feel about them and their appalling acting. <laughs> Uh, Paul Challenge. So it was you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Paul, I said star. Yeah. <laughs> Tim was interrupted, so he gets a point for that as well. 29 seconds, my star sign. Uh, Tim starting now. Pisces, the fish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paul. Sounded like he's introducing an act. <laughs> so it's all hit. Yes. 
And, and the act didn't, hesitation. Right, the act didn't come on stage, did it? Right. So he hesitated, and you have my star sign, and you have 26 seconds starting now. When I had to change my name, my original name is Paul Martin. Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> Clement, yes? Repetition of names. Yeah, two names, right. Clement, you have my star sign, 24 seconds starting now. I read that Torians should be extremely careful this week, lest they be attacked by the militant wing of the Women's Institute, as a result of which I came here by train on a very fast-moving St. Marylebone bound <laughs> I think we hear, we hear a red light. So, Paul, you've probably got in with six seconds to go on my star sign, starting now. When I eat a lot of eggs, I get Marilaban bound, and I don't know what it is. I'm unable, there's something in my stomach. It's, oh, no, it's an awful feeling, and what I actually believe is going to happen is the whistle gone yet. <laughs> Paul Merton, speaking as a whistle, gained that extra point and has increased his lead, and it's his turn to begin. The subject, Paul, is sitting on the fence. Tell us something about sitting on the fence in just a minute, starting now. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, which wasn't really a fence, but it's a similar kind of thing. I suppose sitting on the fence means that you're unable to decide between two opposing points of view. You might, for example, say, Clement Freud is the life and soul of any party. <laughs> on the other hand, people might be able to say, oh, I'm not... Uh, Clement challenge. Two mites. Two mites. Two mites. That's a challenge. So, Clement, you've got a correct challenge that time. 44 seconds. You tell us something about sitting on the fence starting now. Were you trying to go to High Wycombe by train, there are no chairs at Marylebone Station, which leaves you to do nothing but sit on a fence. And the fence is between platforms two and three, and a deeply uncomfortable sitting on the fence <laughs> is also an expression for being unable to decide between two alternatives. Uh, Tim Rice challenge. Uh, you can only have two alternatives, so um, that was deviation from correct English usage. <laughs> Very you can have three alternatives. No, no, then, then they would be possibilities choices. or choices, yes. Oh. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Annabelle's with me. Yes, but I didn't want to be seen to be your friend in this instance. <laughs> <laughs> this is an unpopular challenge. I know, see. we do have this. But an <laughs> accurate one. Yes. So, right, as a wordsmith, we have to bow to you. Yes, um, it, it is actually deviation from uh, grammatical English as we understand it, but not always as we use it, but therefore, what can you do in just a minute but say you have a correct challenge? 23 seconds, Tim, sitting on the fence, starting now. Sitting on the Fence was a hit record in 1966 on the immediate label, a white-coloured bit of the record, which was recorded by an unknown act called Twice As Much. And I would suggest, as it was such a wonderful song, that they reform immediately and go on tour, as so many olden acts are doing very successfully these days. However, Sitting on a Fence in real life is actually extreme. <laughs> So Tim Rice, speaking as a whistle went, and other points in that round, um, has moved forward. He's now in second place behind Paul Merton, just ahead of Clement Freud, and then Annabel Giles. And Annabel, your turn to begin. And the subject now is pop. Tell us something about pop in just a minute, starting now. Uh, pop is one of those words which is the same backwards and forwards, therefore it's called a palindrome, similar to mum and dad. Interesting enough, in America, the word forefather is pop. Pop is also something people are given to drink when they're 14 in pub car parks with a packet of crisps. It is also part of a famous earthquakes... Oh, get me off now, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the, the first person on radio who has actually appealed public to be taken... <laughs> say, get me off. Right, so, Paul, you have decided to get uh, Annabelle off. Thank you. And, um... <laughs> that could have been better phrased, couldn't it? <laughs> And, Paul, you have a correct challenge, and you have 40 seconds on pop starting now. It seems odd to be talking about the subject of pop because we have with us in the shape of Mr. Tim Rice, perhaps one of the foremost experts on this very subject. I, he'll probably be able to put me right, but I believe he may still have every number one that's ever been number one since about 19... Uh, oh. Tim McCroy challenge. <laughs> two number ones so or number two, number two ones, as we call them. Yes. <laughs> Another point, and 27 seconds, you tell us something about pop starting now. Pop would appear to be a secret society at Eton, where young men in funny waistcoats who send letters to their butlers at half term, which is not called by that name because it, the school wants to be special and different and use uh, language. Uh, Paul Talent. Well, we're a long way from pop here, yeah. aren't we? No, we're not. No, no. Pop is, is, a, is a club or a, um, a society at Eton. Is so, it? Yes, it is. <laughs> 
I didn't go there, but I happen to know that. Well, I don't remember it being mentioned when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a coach trip, and we were only there for about three hours. <laughs> I'd like to give you some bonus points for your humour, but uh, I'm afraid... Then do! No, 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 no. <laughs> Clemmer gets one for being interrupted. He has 12 seconds on pop, starting now. Carbon dioxide is absolutely essential for the creation of pop. Iron brew, ginger beer, lace with aniseed, almost any carbonated... <laughs> Clemmer, with the points in that round, including one for speaking as a whistle, went, has moved forward. He's ahead of Tim Rice. He's two behind Paul Merton. And, Tim, it's your turn to begin. Catchy lyrics. Tell us something about that subject, which is close to your heart and something I hope you can talk about with confidence. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I see you are a logger and not a common bum, because nobody but a lumberjack stirs coffee with his thumb. This is an example of a very catchy lyric, but by and large, and that is a yachting expression, in case you didn't know it, I think it is impossible for lyrics to be catchy. Music is catchy, and whoever phrased this category should be taken out quietly and given a stern talking to. You cannot have catchy lyrics. It is absolutely out of the question. Lyrics are far too subtle, far too intelligent, far too... Uh, Clement Freuton. <laughs> yes. Far too often. Far too, yes. <laughs> You were getting so passionate about your personal subject, Tim, that you got carried away and repeated 29 seconds, Clement, on catchy lyrics starting now. Half a pound of tuppany rice, shrippen's worth of treacle, that's the way the weasel goes, pop goes. Uh, <laughs> oh, <hello. Well>, indeed. <laughs> well, the, the lick's so catchy, he's completely mangled it. <laughs> So, deviation from the lyrics. You, from the original lyric. Yeah, well yeah. done, Paul. 21 seconds, catchy lyrics starting now. Of course, we have to listen to what Tim says because he has made a great deal of money and had enormous success writing lyrics. My favourite lyricist, I suppose, is probably Irving Berlin. Or is it maybe Cole Porter? In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked upon as something shocking. Now, heaven knows, anything goes. I'd scan was slightly wrong, but I think you get the general meaning and thrust of what I was saying. <laughs> Paul Merton, speaking as the whistle went again, the next point has increased his lead uh, over Clement Freud, Tim Rice, and Annabelle Giles in that order. Clement Freud, your turn to begin, and the subject now is the gravy train. Tell us something about the gravy train in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. The gravy train could be a description of any diesel or locomotive driven vehicle in which a mixture of bisto, oxo, marmite, <laughs> and mascara is poured over the food and drink in the restaurant car therein. Gravy trains go from all London terminals, St. Pancras, Houston, Paddington, Victoria, Fenchurch Street, Waterloo, and London Bridge. I've said London twice. <laughs> I was going to say, when are you going to say Marylebone? Because surely that's going to come into this as well. Annabelle, you have the gravy train. You have 31 seconds starting now. I always thought a gravy train was better known as a gravy boat, which is, after all, a jug thing which has a saucer attached. I never know why they are all in one piece. You would have thought that they'd be easier to wash up if they were separated. But no, a gravy, the other thing implying a ship word. Oh, for <laughs> good. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, oh. Chivalry. Yes. Uh, chivalry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, she was coming to a halt of uh, some kind. Like, uh, 17 seconds, the gravy train with you, Paul, starting now. I've been doing just a minute now since 1988, and the gravy train really... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two eights. Mm -hmm. Eighty. <laughs> Eighty-eight. 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 Oh. Eighty-eight. 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 Was yeah. well, that your challenge? But no, it did. <laughs> Eighty. Eight. Walked into my trap. <laughs> My gravy trap. Yes, your gravy <laughs> trap. They're two different words, AT and eight. So uh, you can't have challenge for half a word, uh, which is a pity. <laughs> so, Paul, an incorrect challenge. Twelve seconds, the gravy train starting now. I've since toured the world promoting this wonderful show. I sell T-shirts in Bombay, souvenir teacups and saucers. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of tea. <laughs> Your 
Well, well, somebody somebody on Friday, 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 back there, Nicholas. <laughs> There's going to be a hanging right. in Holly Wickham. <laughs> I tell you what, look, look as, you, as you're so belligerent, <laughs> and you frighten me, <laughs> uh, I, will, I, will, no, I will let you be the superior judge. I will let you judge. If you agree with, with Emma Freud's challenge, you cheer for him, and if you disagree, you boo for Paul Merton, and you all do it together, together now. <laughs> Well, that's the biggest boo you've ever had, boy. <laughs> and uh, so you get it. Five seconds on the gravy train, starting numb. I remember the A-team. Who remembers Mr. T? What a fantastic <laughs> character. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? Tim. Well, I... A, there was a repetition of T, and B, this is absolute deviation. What's it got to do with the gravy train? Uh, yes, very popular show. Sure, they made an awful lot of money. <laughs> Can I ask which T he repeated? <laughs> Tim, two more seconds. T, uh, not T, no, that's not the <laughs> Gravy train. The gravy train starting now. The common market is a typical... <laughs> so Tim was speaking as a whistle went. He's now equal with Clement Freud in second place, head of Annabelle Giles and they're, they're all training Paul Merton, who is in the lead. And Tim, it's your turn to begin. The subject, swan. Can you tell us something about swan in just a minute, starting now? Swan conjures up so many wonderful images, it's hard to know where to begin talking about such a magnificent topic. Swan, the bird in flight, the bird... Paul, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, challenge, yes. When he said he, he, it was hard to know where to begin, <laughs> um, the swan was repeated twice. The, it the was? Bird, the bird, yeah. Uh, the, the bird, the yeah. bird was repeated, right. Yeah. 49 seconds, swan with you. Paul starting now. It makes an excellent Sunday lunch. The only difficulty is trying to cram it into the casserole dish because they're quite nasty little buggers and they'll get a little beak in it. And you're trying to chop up the vegetables and suddenly you get hold of the bird. Uh, uh, Tim Challenge. Well, deviation. First he said they were large and then he said they were little. <laughs> well, some of them are little, if you know. And large. frankly, rather disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't think he was deviating with the rules of just a minute, so he keeps swan and he has 39 seconds starting now. I believe the Queen owns all the swans on the Thames, and there is a particular practice that happens around about a certain time of the year called swan upping, which is an offence on the Isle of Man, but it can still get away with it <laughs> along the banks of that marvellous waterway. I suppose the wonderful... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. He's supposed before. You said, I? I suppose, oh, yes. yes. Lord. Clement, 23 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> swan starting now. Kentucky Fried Swans can't do that. <laughs> oh, you challenge me. Hesitation. Thanks. Yeah, yes, yes. He got such an amazing reaction, he couldn't continue. Uh, so, uh, 17 seconds, Swan, with you, Paul, starting now. Like Clement, I love Kentucky Fried Swan. I often get a beacon chips on a Saturday night, and it's wonderful because you can put the vinegar inside the mouth of the actual swan itself, and you can dip your French fries in that, and it makes the most delicious. Uh, uh, Tim Challenge. We had French fries, or fries, more than once. Chips, I said, then French fries. Mm. You... Uh... Oh, no, they're going to turn you again. You had Look. chips before. <laughs> French fries oh, now. You said French fries twice. Oh, sorry, it's none of my business, is it? <laughs> the audience oh, think it's their business, whatever happens. So. <laughs> it was chips before. Uh, five seconds on Swan with you, Paul, starting now. I believe it was Proust. Uh, Clement Challenge. He's believed before. Yeah. He's believed before, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, no. you have. I'm right. Four seconds, Clement Swan, starting now. The Swan Burger with Pommes Frites <laughs> is the sort of thing <laughs> I would really like. Right, Clement Freud uh, was speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point, and we're moving into the last round, which is very sad because we're enjoying ourselves. Ah, you're enjoying yourselves, are you? Right, cheer them on their way. What a lovely subject to finish on, Frederick Chopin. Clement, it's your turn to begin. Tell us something about Frederick Chopin in just a minute, starting now. There was a Polish musician called Frederick Chopin, who was um, from Poland, and went. So, Paul, you had the first challenge, 48 seconds. Yes, Frédéric Chopin, starting now. Fred Chopin was possibly the finest mouth organist ever to come out of the Hackney area. <laughs> On a Saturday night, he'd be down the pub and people would say, whip it out and give it a blow, and he would. In front of the surprised publican and all the regulars, the customers would gather around and they would sing the old tunes as the harmonica blasted. <laughs> uh, the mouth Tim organ and harmonica. What's your, what's your challenge, Tim? I was just 
wanting to say that he said Mark Orkin and then harmonica and how... <laughs> <laughs> and how clever of it. How clever that was. How <laughs> clever he was. It's... So, Paul's got another point. Give Tim a point for that. We like the introduction. It doesn't really matter the final result. And, um... <laughs> Paul, you have 31 seconds on Frederick Chopin starting now. Of course, the, the instrument that he composed for was the piano, and he is known, perhaps, as one of the finest writers of that particular <laughs> instrument. Uh, Tim Challenge. Well, I'm sure he had two instruments, and maybe two finest. I think well. you did indeed mm. have both, and this time you are in on the subject. With 24 seconds, Frederick Chopin starting now. It amazes me every time I think of the genius of Frederick Chopin, how he was able to create such magic by simply using a few notes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the sharps and flats that relate to those particular letters. He was at... Uh, he was Clement. I thought he said he was. No. <laughs> I think he said he was, and if not, he was doing the French thing. He was, you no. know. No, no, I'm not going to allow that one, Tim. You've got two seconds, two seconds more from you on Frederick Chopin. Bring the show to a close in a flourish, starting now. Good old Fred, what a fan. <laughs> and good old Fred also is the composer of the tune, which is the signature tune of Just a Minute. And this particular edition of the show, Tim Rice was speaking then, when the whistle went, he's moved forward. He's equaling Clement Floyd in second place, just ahead of Annabelle Giles. But out in the lead by a considerable number of points was Paul Merton. So, Paul, we say, this week, you are our winner. And it only remains me to say thank you to our four outstanding players of the game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Tim Rice and Annabel Giles. I also thank Janet Staplehurst for helping with the score and her whistle, and also our producer, Claire Jones, for being so patient and tolerant with us all. And uh, also we're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created Just a Minute, and we are also indebted to this lovely audience here in the Swan Theatre at High Wycombe, who have cheered us on their way, even though they become an unruly mob on occasions. <laughs> From them, from the panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time we play Just a Minute. Until then, from all of us, goodbye.